Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Now Let's Be Honest. I am David Tate, and um, I'm excited to talk about The Chosen Season 4, Episodes 7 and 8 with y'all. Uh, in the live chat, we got Barbara here. Hey, Barbara, guess whose shirt? Guess who sent me this shirt right here? That was you. Uh, hey, Barbara. Good to see you. Um, hello, AJ. Um, one thing I need to just mention right off the bat before we get started today uh, is that you will notice that Brianne, my lovely co-host, is not with me today. Um, that is because her and I were scheduled to go see these episodes together um, whenever they first opened up, but um, unfortunately she got sick, and so she had to cancel last minute, and she didn't get to go with me, and so she was fully planning on being here tonight, but unfortunately um, it's just us today, so I'm going to really need y'all's help uh, in the live chat today just so I have somebody to talk to, so I'm not just staring at a camera talking to myself for hours because that would make me feel a little bit crazy and also um, it made me very sad. So um, please be just commenting in the live chat so I have somebody to talk to. I'm very excited to talk about these episodes with y'all. Uh, before we get started, let me just kind of just clarify how we're going to go about this whole discussion. Uh, we're going to begin like we have in the past. We're going to start with a spoiler-free discussion, uh, and then we are going to go into the spoiler talk. So before we even get started, let me just put non-spoiler section down at the bottom so nobody has to worry about spoilers right off the bat. Uh, Barbara says, I love your shirt. Yes, Barbara, um, I do appreciate this. You sent this my way. Uh, what perfect timing. Just got home from the theater from seeing them. Good, Debbie. I am glad to hear that because we are going to talk all about them and I'm glad to talk about it with you. Hello. Hi from California. Ooh, hello. Mobile. Yes. Cool. I don't even know. Yes. Um, you said speedy recovery. She actually is feeling better by now, which is great. Um, I'm glad to say that she is feeling better, but unfortunately, just the way the timing worked is that um, she just, she was feeling sick enough on the day of the premiere that she didn't get to go to it. Uh, but even yesterday she was feeling a lot better. And so, um, it just kind of just didn't work out there, but, uh, she has said that she can't wait to see these episodes. And so we will, uh, hopefully get to hear her thoughts on it at a later time. And so I'm excited to get through that. Yeah. Uh, just got home from seeing episode seven through eight. Wow. Yes, I agree. Uh, Tennessee present Tony in Altamonte Springs, Florida. I'm actually going to be in Florida, um, for spring break this next week. Uh, well not this week, but the next week. Uh, I'm actually going to Disney World, which is going to be fun. I haven't been to Disney in years, probably since I was well, a long time ago. Um, so I will be in Disney very soon. Prayers just had a bad asthma. To, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, we will pray. You know what? Um, before we actually hop into the spoiler-free discussion, we will actually open up with a word of prayer. So I will uh, be sure to mention that in there. Uh, hey, nerds. Then I say that with the greatest love. Yes. Hello, Bible nerds. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, well, um, yes, asthma attack. So, um, yeah, we'll pray for that in just a second. Um, real quick, let me just open us up with a word of prayer, and then we will not waste any time. We will just hop right in and get to our non-spoiler discussion, followed by the spoiler discussion later on. Dear Lord, thank you so much for allowing us to be here right now. Uh, I think that it's just an amazing privilege that I get to make friends with people that I don't even know face-to-face, -face, right? I mean, the internet in many ways is a scary thing, but can also it can also be a beautiful thing, God. And so I thank you for that. And I thank you that uh, even though I don't get to see their faces, God, I do get to communicate with these people. I think that's just amazing. Uh, I also thank you, God, for the show, The Chosen. I know that at times it can be controversial and at times people can just have super extreme opinions about it. But ultimately, uh, this show has been a beautiful work of art that has... Um, Lord willing, advance your kingdom. And we thank you for that, God. And I thank you for the amazing conversations that this show produces. I thank you for just the artistic vision behind it and the different ways that maybe it has challenged us and the ways that it has opened up our minds to your scriptures, God. Uh, I pray that as we go about our discussion tonight, it will be a sober-minded and thoughtful approach that will be um, that, that will stray away from extremes and will try to just approach things with discernment and clarity. Uh, we love you, God. We thank you for the show. I thank you for everything that you are doing in the world, God. Uh, and for the people who in the live chat have already voiced uh, different things that they need prayer requests for, God. I just lift those up to you. You know what they are, God. Uh, and for those who maybe haven't even shared them, God, I lift those up to you as well. And I pray that you will meet them uh, where they need to be met, God, and that you will make your will known to them uh, and will provide for them in all their um, different needs. We thank you, God. We love you and praise you for who you are. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, so um, there we go. Uh, oh, oh, Tony, you are 25 to 30 miles north of Disney. Well, very cool. We will be kind of near to each other then. Okay, so let's just hop right in. Um, be sure to just like kind of track with me and just share your thoughts with me in the live chat. Since Brienne is not here, I will try to be interacting with y'all more in the live chat than normally um, because normally I'm trying to focus more on what she's saying and stuff and I'm not trying to, you know, be divided in my thoughts, but it's just me and y'all today. And so as I'm talking, feel free to just share your thoughts and I will interact with y'all. 
so let's talk about non-spoilers. Um, what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to um, just do things the same way we have in the past. I'm going to share the pros. I'm going to share the cons. Uh, and then I will give you a ranking for how I view these two episodes. And I guess there's not much of a ranking because there's only two episodes. Uh, but I'll let you know which one I liked more and which one I liked less. I don't know if we did that last week, but I meant to. And so if we didn't, I apologize. I, I'm probably, I'll, I'm, I will probably do a ranking video eventually on this channel. And so, yeah, uh, as I just got my notes over here on my iPad, um, it looks like I have seven pros and two cons. Uh, and I will say right off the bat that the seven pros are much bigger and the two cons are just nitpicks that um, really aren't that big of a deal. Uh, and since we're in the spoiler free section, I probably won't even be able to talk about them that much because they're kind of specific to the episodes. Um, but yeah, so let, let's just walk through them, right? Okay, and be sure to let me know your pros and cons in the um, the comment section because that will really um, just give me something to work with here. All right, pro number one, one thing that I loved about these two episodes, uh, and this really speaks to the season as a whole, is the buildup. I loved the buildup that you felt, especially in these last two episodes, um, to where you just felt everything building up to a climax, right? I mean, especially, I think you felt that especially in the season because the whole season has had this idea of moving us further and further towards the ultimate fate that Jesus knows he's heading to, right? Because, you know, for, I mean, as Bible readers, we know where this story's heading, right? Um, really, the exciting aspect is just seeing how they're going to portray it on screen. Um, but seasons one through three were very much, I mean, they had a clear sense of direction and stuff, but they were more about introducing us to the characters, Whereas once you get to season four here, there seems to be a clear sense of direction where we are working our way to the cross. And I don't think you feel that any more than in these two episodes right here uh, to where just, I felt like as I was watching these two episodes, you were just sitting on the edge of your seat, which is really an amazing task if you think about it, because this story has been out for 2000 years, right? I mean, it shouldn't be something that elicits like, like nail biting and like anxiety and anticipation as you're watching it, because we know where it's heading but it still does, uh, which I think speaks to the artistry behind the show and how well that they've crafted this whole show that um, you can still have that level of anticipation and um, almost almost fear as you see where this story is heading. Uh, I, I just thought it was really well done because I mean, I think about like, you know, like, you know, all those times you're watching something artistic that you love and you're just like, man, I wish I could re-experience this again for the first time. I feel like, I, I think that's so often with the Bible right? There are so many times in the Bible, I'm like, man, I wish I could go back and read this story again for the first time. And I've done that with other works of art as well. I love, I wish I could just read the Harry Potter series again for the first time, right? Or, um, or Narnia or Star Wars, right? I mean, I think that'd be so cool to just re-experience it for the first time. But with the Bible, especially, I'm like, man, how cool would it be to re-experience that? And something about whenever you're watching the show, um, I know it's not a perfect one-to-one -one biblical adaptation and stuff like that, but it gets the closest to that experience of reliving something for the first time because we're watching a familiar story, but we're kind of getting excited to see how they're going to adapt it. And I just really felt that in the season. And so my first pro is just that you really feel that buildup to where as I was watching it, and especially with these two episodes, I just had my eyes locked on the screen and I was just excited to see how they were going to do the things that were coming. And even though you know where the story is heading, you just feel this anticipation over how they're going to adapt it. And I thought that was just very, very well done. So that was pro number one, the buildup. I'll talk about pro number two in a second, but let me see what y'all have been saying. Um, let's see. It is not playing anywhere near me, so I appreciate even the spoilers. Okay, well, there you go. Cool. I'm glad that you don't mind spoilers. Hello from Rhode Island. Non-spoiler thoughts. It was very well done. Really liked episode eight more, though. I emotionally responded more in episode seven. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm going to share my rankings in a second, so you'll see where I land and all that. Uh, it was much easier for me to digest two episodes in one setting than three. I agree with that 100%. Um, I really struggled with the three episode thing. And I, there was somebody on my comments, I think a few videos ago, who said that I'm too young to appreciate binge watching stuff. And I got where they were coming from, but I like binge watching stuff. It's just, I think with The Chosen, there's just so much content in there that I like to just soak it in, right? And I think it's one of those shows that is better digested one episode at a time. Uh, and so watching three episodes back to back was, that was a bit difficult for me because I was like, man, like I enjoyed it, but I felt like I couldn't appreciate each episode. And as a result, the episodes ended up blending together. And so um, whenever the episodes come back out on the app, um, I'm going to probably enjoy it even more watching them one episode at a time and being able to digest it better. Um, let's see. 
Um, the weight of the cross was well felt. Yes, I agree. Uh, seeds have been planted. Absolutely. Cinematic quality amped way up compared to season one. Don't worry. We're going to be getting there in my pros list. Uh, JT says, hello all. Uh, hey, JT. Okay, so my first pro was the buildup. I loved the buildup in this um, th these two episodes and really through the whole season. I thought that was fantastic, um, which then kind of just like just flows directly into my second pro, which is the structure of these episodes individually and the season as a whole. I mentioned this in my out of theater reaction, um, which is a little short that I posted a few days ago on Thursday, I guess. But I think that this probably was the best structured season of the show entirely. Right. And, and I mean, I'm including season one in that. Uh, I'm not saying that this is my favorite season. I don't know. I'm still going to have to wrestle through that. I mean, I think my temptation is to say this is my favorite season, but I think that also um, we all tend to say things like that whenever we experience something new. I think I'm going to have to rewatch the episodes a few more times and digest them and stuff to really give my thoughts there. But um, I've been at like saying for a while now that I think season one was structured way better, just in my own personal opinion right? Then seasons two and three. I think seasons two and three were very good. I think they're fantastic episodes, but season one to me felt the most structured on both like an individual and big, like both small scale and big picture, if that makes sense, right? But this season, the structure behind it was great to where every episode felt like a good self-contained individual episode, but those episodes also contributed to the season as a whole and flowed from one into the next. And so I think from an artistic perspective, I just, I can't praise the writers enough for this season because this season to me felt the strongest in regards to structure because every episode felt unique. Every episode felt like it had a contained story, but every episode also felt like it contributed to the season as a whole to where when you look at the season, there was a clear starting point and ending point and everything in between contributed to getting us there. And so I think that was really, really well done. And so I just can't help but praise that enough. And really a lot of the things I'm going to say in my pros here are, um, are more from the artistic perspective, I guess, mainly because I can't really dive into the biblical stuff in the non-spoiler section because that would require me to spoil stuff. I mean, I guess I could mention Lazarus being raised to life and stuff, but that's because that's not a spoiler. We've known that was coming in this season, right? But um, most of the pros I'm going to list are from an artistic perspective because that's the stuff I can just speak about from a non-spoiler way. And so I love the buildup of the season and I loved the structure. I thought the structure was done, done really well. I thought it was really well paced. Uh, obviously there are always times where I wish that they would include more Bible stories and stuff, but I had to come to terms with that back in like season one where I'm just like, ah, okay, I'm not going to get what I want there. Uh, and so I'm kind of just along for the ride and there might be certain places where I gripe and stuff. Um, but this season I thought was just really well executed from a structural perspective. Let's see what y'all say right here. Loved, loved, loved episode seven and eight. So many nuances that became real watching the episodes. I agree. Uh, seamless structure. Yes. Um, seamless is probably the perfect word um, for that, for sure. Uh, I thought about Harry Potter during one scene that I bet you're going to talk about in spoiler time. I agree with the structure of the writing being so strong. Hmm. Whenever we get to the spoiler section, you're gonna have to tell me what scene that is because, uh, I don't know. There wasn't anything in particular that made me think of Harry Potter, but whenever we get there, you're, you're going to have to let me know because I would love to find that connection. Um, this season's credits lasted, uh, listed the three writers in a different order with Dallas last. Do you think that contributed to the structure you're talking about? I don't know. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Um, I don't think I even sat through all the credits uh, to where I, I didn't even notice that. Um, hmm. I don't know. Or unless you're talking about the opening credits. I'm not sure if you mean the opening credits or not. Um, I don't know. Um, I think that they've typically said that it was just a, like, it's just evenly divided. I, I really can't speculate in regards to that because I don't really know the technical details behind how they choose what order to list people in. Um, if anything, if Dallas was listed first in the past, I imagine it's because um, he was probably the primary writer for a lot of it in the past, because I know that in seasons one, two, and three, he specifically had an entire episode, which was really just his episode to write, right? Season one, season two, and season three, episode three of each of those seasons, that was Dallas's episode to write, whereas that stopped with season four. And so it could be that it just, the the order shifted because of, I don't know, they, they just, Dallas didn't have an episode by himself. I don't know. I really can't speak in regards to that because I just don't know uh, anything there. But there's a thought. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so pro number one was the buildup. Pro number two was the structure. And pro number three is the acting. I thought the acting was really well done, um, not only in these episodes, but also in the season as a whole. And I feel like a lot of the pros I'm going to list here are pros about the entire season, because I think what is true about these two episodes individually is true about the season as a whole. 
And I think that everybody stepped their game up in this season. Really, as I like, whenever I think about the show as a whole, the acting in general has been far beyond what I'm used to seeing in Christian shows, right? Like both the, the cinematography, the acting, the production quality, all of it is better than what I'm used to seeing in Christian shows. Um, but it seems like with each season, as the actors get better and more accustomed to being in their characters, they've just gotten really better at playing those parts. And I think that is really evident. I mean, there's only a few scenes that I can think about over the entire season four where the acting kind of stood out to me and I was like, Ooh, it kind of took me out of the scene. Um, but I think that's still really good because I mean, that can happen in literally any TV show. Uh, so I, I thought the acting was really well done. And I thought that especially in these two episodes, since there's so much emotional weight that the actors are having to, um, to carry during all this. And really once again, throughout the whole season, that's probably why the acting stands out so much. It's because since this season is such a tense season, you just get to see the actors bust out their acting chops. And I think that that's just going to continue as we go into seasons five and six, because as we know, <laughs> it's not going to get any better, right? Until season seven, right? And so things are going to get darker and darker, and there's going to be more emotional weight. And we are now getting into the story aspects of the Gospels, which are naturally most compelling from an emotional perspective. And so I think that we just got to see the actors at their A game in this season, uh, and specifically in these two episodes. And I, I expect that to just continue as we go forward um, because um, they're just get, they have more to deal with, right? Um, because in the opening seasons, I mean, really, there's kind of a structure to what all of them have to do, right? I mean, they all started at a place of brokenness and then they meet Jesus and things start getting better. And then there's a few actors who they got to explore some more things. But really, once you get to this season, we're introduced to all the characters and now we just get to see those guys grow and develop. And so um, I thought the acting was really, really well done. And so uh, let me go back to y'all's live comments here. I'm just going to y'all's live comments in between each pro. Uh, let's see. Credits are determined by contract too. Maybe they had something listed in their contract. That's possible as well. Um, yep. Acting thoughts. Joey took home the gold this season. He was phenomenal. Um, yes, I thought Joey did good. Joey, if, uh, for those of you who don't know, I believe Joey is the one who plays Thomas. He did a very, very good job um, acting. And I'll, I'll talk about Joey's acting um, later on. Um, in the, in the spoiler discussion later, but I don't want to talk about it right now because I don't spoil anything, but Joey did a very good job. Uh, I don't think Dallas did his episode three. No, he did not. He did not do episode three this season. Um, that was something that he did in the past, but I don't think he's doing that going forward. Um, wh which makes sense because in the, once again, the first three seasons are introducing us to people. And so there was a little bit more wiggle room. Uh, whereas as you get into these final seasons, there's kind of clear story beats they have to hit. And so for him to have an individual episode where he kind of does his own thing, um, th there doesn't seem to be as much room for that, even though I will say, um, I mean, if, if you're just following the trajectory of this, I'm really wondering how they're going to do season six, because they're going to have to stretch the events out. Um, maybe we'll talk about that in the spoiler discussion, if I remember, um, cause I've got some thoughts about that. Uh, let's see. Hello, David. Hello. <laughs> Toby Vahedi, uh, is my vote for MVP. Who is Toby Vahedi? Let me Google this real quick. Cause, um, I'm not aware of his name. Real, um, let's see. Um, I don't know who Toby Vahedi is. I'm not sure. So I can't tell you whether he's the MVP or not. <laughs> I wish I could. Uh, episode threes are like filler episodes in past seasons. They don't have time for too much filler anymore. Exactly. That's what I was just saying. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed episode seven and eight. Touched the heartstrings. It was hard for me to see Jesus in tears at the tomb of Lazarus. Um, yes. Um, yeah. Uh, we will talk about that when we get to the spoiler discussion for sure. Because I have some thoughts about that as well. Jonathan Ruby seemed to have more scripture this season. He did. Yeah, he had to. Um, he had to quote a lot of scripture. I think um, we'll talk about that in the spoiler discussion too. I think they're trying to like fit some scripture in there because some of the scripture he's quoting is from all over the place. Um, and it's like, they're just like trying to like, it's almost like Easter eggs in a way. Um, it's not quite the same as Easter eggs, but this is what it feels like. Um, actors on their A game. Yes. Loved Lazarus seen with Jesus. The acting was a game. Jonathan Rumi gets to play different flavors of Jesus that we haven't seen before. Yeah. I imagine that Jonathan probably has a really, um, a really fun time playing Jesus because he gets an opportunity to explore Jesus in ways that we've never really seen him depicted. And that must be, it's, it's probably very challenging, but, um, but probably very fun to just explore that. And I imagine it has to be a worshipful experience to try to step into that mindset. Uh, you have to be careful with it, but uh, Joey. Oh, okay. Yes. Cause I think Joey, yes. I think Joey is his last name is Vahedi. That's what you're saying. Okay. Joey Vahedi is the guy who plays Thomas. That makes sense. Okay. Yes. Uh, Joey Vahedi is the um, guy who plays Thomas and he, yes. He is the MVP, I think. Uh, many of the actors look authentic Mediterranean. Yeah, um, I was watching an interview with Dallas where he was saying that they have to go out of their way to try to, um, you know, make sure that people look like that. 
And the one place I did notice it um, in the final episode, which this isn't a spoiler because they had this huge cast, like they had all these extras fly in for it and stuff. Um, during the final scenes of episode eight, I did notice that people didn't look authentically Mediterranean, but that's because there was a lot of extras and you can't get everybody to do that. But it also works because of the timing and what would have been going on in Jerusalem at that time. Not everybody has to look specifically Mediterranean. And so um, it actually worked out that way. Uh, and also um, what we have in the show is a million times better than what we see in like other shows where Jesus is like blonde hair, blue eyed. Right. And so that's um, very good. Very good. If the disciples haven't figured out that, that Judas is sus, they're really slow. I agree. <laughs> we'll talk about that probably when we get to the spoiler section as well, because I think that Judas does seem very, very sus um, throughout these episodes. Um, love the acting as well, including Judas. Hard to watch, but good depiction so far. Yes, we will talk about Judas. Sorry to hear Brian was sick. Why don't you marry that girl? Believe me, I um, that that sounds great to me. Um, we were. <laughs> don't worry. That's that's the trajectory we're hoping for. Yes. Uh, okay. So, pro number one: build up. Pro number two: structure. Pro number three: acting. And now pro number four is biblical adaptation. Uh, we only have a few scenes that are straight. Actually, we, have, we actually have quite a bit of scenes that are from the Bible depicted in these two episodes. Uh, probably more scenes in these two episodes than we have in a lot of episodes. But I thought they were really well done. Right? I thought that um, I, I, I can't go into spoilers too much, even though, once again, is are you really spoiling something that came out 2,000 years ago? Um, but I just thought the biblical adaptation in these two episodes was really, really, really well done. Um, I talked about my frustrations back with episode three with how some of the biblical stories were adapted. Um, but that was episode three is really the only place I think in the entire show where I've been truly frustrated with how biblical text was handled. I think there was like one place in season two where I was like, eh, I didn't really care for that too much. Um, but by and large, I've been very happy with how The Chosen has adapted biblical stories. And I, and even in the places where I'm a little bit more frustrated, I understand why they had to do it that way, given the constraints of the fictional storylines that they're telling. Um, but these scenes, in, like the scenes that we got in these episodes in, particularly, in particular, the way they fleshed them out and made them, I, I don't want to say more real, because obviously the biblical stories are real, but the biblical stories are very limited in the details they share, right? The way that they portrayed them in live action, right? I thought it was really well done. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk more about those in the spoiler discussion, but I just thought that the way that the biblical stories were adapted was a very, very positive thing. And as a Bible nerd, um, that is something that just makes me very happy because um, I know that you're supposed to go into the show and you're just supposed to treat it like a work of art and you're almost supposed to watch it without thinking that the Bible exists, but I can't help but watch it with the Bible in mind, right? I mean, that this is what you inherently do, right? Whenever you watch the Harry Potter movies and you've read the Harry Potter books, you can't help but think, oh yeah, like this was different in the book. Or whenever you're watching the Lord of the Rings movies and you've read the books, you're like, where's Tom Bombadil, right? And so um, you can't help but do that. I know that you're supposed to watch the things individually and I can appreciate The Chosen as its own merit, as a biblical piece. I mean, as a, um, as a work of art, right? I can appreciate it like that. But I also can't divorce it from the fact that um, it is inspired by the book that I find most treasured, right? The book that is in the inspired word of God. And um, to be fair, that's also how I treat everything else, right? Whenever I'm watching Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter, I'm always watching it through a biblical lens. Uh, and even whenever I'm just watching any movie or something or reading any book, that's usually what I'm doing. I just kind of analyze everything. Uh, and so naturally I'm going to compare it to the Bible. And the way that they adapted the Bible in these two episodes was fantastic. And so I just thought that was really, really, really well done. And so a biblical adaptation would be my fourth pro. I've got three more, but let's see what people have to say here. Hi, I watched episode seven and eight and I love them. The death and resurrection of Lazarus was awesome. The action and reaction of Thomas was great also. Yes, we will talk about that in the spoiler discussion. My main man, I think you're talking about, uh, that's Joey again. Um, I had noticed in other seasons, the writer were mentioned, or the writers were mentioned in one order, but when the title changed, the order changed. Uh, yeah, once again, I, I don't think I paid enough attention to the opening credits or anything. Um, agree the biblical adaptation this season was very strong. Yes. Um, I think there was a lot. Um, and even going back into episode ooh, four, episode four of this season, which we talked about in our last spoiler discussion, um, there, there was some genius stuff. I mean, I think episode four is where you really got to see the writers at like, just, just blasting on all cannons, some stuff that they accomplished and how they adapted the stories of scripture in the season. Um, it was just so genius, right? Like they, they did such a good way of like weaving stuff together. And even where they've had to adapt things, the way that they just brought it together was really, really well done. Agree. Definitely see the chosen as a support resource to the Bible. Absolutely. 
Uh, it was nice to see more biblical scenes. Yes. Yeah. We got a lot here. Uh, and what I'm excited for is that as we go into, I mean, really next season should be a lot of Bible stuff um, because we are covering, I mean, next season is going to cover one week of time. And the cool thing is that in the Bible, you basically get a day by day, like play out of that week. Um, so I'm going to be interested to see how they actually adapt that. Uh, I, I'm kind of hoping that they do like a, like, have you ever seen the TV show, like 24, you know, like where there's like a countdown on the screen. I would love if they did that, uh, especially when they get to season six, that would be awesome. <laughs> we'll see if they do that. Okay. So let's get to pro number five. So pro number one was build up. Pro number two was structure. Pro number three was acting. Pro number four was biblical adaptation. And pro number five is what I'm calling stringing pearls. Uh, if you don't know what stringing pearls is, stringing pearls is basically an ancient way of referring to um, the idea of tying very different uh, interconnected Bible passages together, right? So for instance, when you're reading the book of Romans and Paul starts like quoting, like, you know, he goes on like this long thing where he just starts like saying like, as it is written, and then he quotes from like 10 Psalms in a row, that's stringing pearls, right? It's like Paul, it's like, he's like on a roll and he like quotes one scripture and then that scripture makes him think of another scripture. And so he quotes that one. And then he quotes this one, he quotes that one. And he's basically stringing these all beautiful pearls together, right? They did that really well in these two episodes. Um, there were places where they're adapting one biblical scene, but in the midst of that biblical scene, they quote another thing from the Bible. And maybe it's something that they haven't adapted yet. Maybe it's something from a different part of scripture, but they just, they strung it together so well to where as somebody who teaches and preaches and um, whose favorite pastime is to study the Bible, it made me very happy. Um, because also that's a very dangerous thing to do because a lot of times what you can do is you can do that out of context, right? Uh, and that's one of the most frustrating things to me whenever I am listening to a sermon or something, whenever people start stringing pearls and they start quoting things, but the thing, but those passages have like nothing to do with one another. And you can tell that they're just quoting them side by side because they have the same like wording or something. That always drives me nuts. But in these episodes, they did such a good job and they made connections between stories that I had never even thought of parallels there. Uh, and from a fictional perspective, it seems like they included those scenes in those places so that they didn't have to adapt them later or to excuse not having adapted it earlier. But it worked out because it was a way for them to include those scriptures uh, while also highlighting more profound insights to those scriptures, right? And so um, once again, I guess really this pro is me just praising the writers for what they've done uh, because it was just really well done. And as somebody who loves studying the Bible, I just, you, you can tell they've done the research and you could tell that they were careful in how they did it. And um, yeah, I just, uh, I, I don't really have much to say beyond that because I can't tell you the exact passages because that would be a spoiler, but I'm sure that that will come up as we go about our spoiler discussion itself. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, I enjoyed all scriptures during these episodes. Absolutely. And great example of stringing pearls. Jesus and Lazarus conversation won't spoil it though. Uh, yes. Jesus and Lazarus, um, yeah, there's a conversation Jesus and Lazarus have that they string pearls there. Um, then there was also one, um, let me just say, the dinner scene at Lazarus's house in episode eight. Uh, that one, that scene, that without spoiling anything, um, because I know that we've seen pictures from that scene and stuff like that online, and so I don't think it's a spoiler. Um, but there was a dinner scene there where they just like strung together so many different things. And I was sitting there and I couldn't take notes fast enough on my phone, but also it was like hard to motivate myself to take notes on my phone because I was like trying to watch the screen and I was so excited. And I was like, ah, as a Bible nerd, I was freaking out. I was like, this is great. Like they just like strung together so many different things and it was mwah, chef's kiss, beautiful. Uh, and so can we cut to the spoilers already? Don't worry, we'll get there. Patience. I'm just, I'm trying to give the people who haven't seen it yet an opportunity to you know, in, like, you know, to get excited with us and then we will get to spoilers. Don't worry. We will get there. It's coming very soon. Uh, I've got two more pros, then two cons, and then I'll give you my ranking and then we will get to spoilers. Don't you worry. Okay. So uh, pro number one was build up. Pro number two was structure. Pro number three was acting. Pro number four was biblical adaptation. Pro number five was stringing pearls. And pro number six is theological exploration slash reflection slash complexity. What I mean by that is that um, in these two episodes, I think we really get to see the showrunners taking advantage of the fictional format by which they're portraying these events. Uh, and what I mean by that is that we, we've seen them doing this in the past, but I, I think I appreciated this more in these two episodes. We get to see them through the, the nature of the form of art that they're creating. They're exploring certain theological implications or possibilities that you wouldn't really have an opportunity to explore in another format, 
right? And for instance, like, let me just give an example without spoiling anything. The character of Jesus, right? I was talking about this earlier with just Jonathan Rumi acting, right? With, with Jesus, they're able to explore more of what it looked like to be truly God, truly man, that I can't really imagine you would get the opportunity to explore in any other way than perhaps a historical fiction novel, right? Because if you think about it, um, in the Bible, you get to see Jesus, but you only get to see the aspects of Jesus that we need to see in order to understand what the gospels, what the evangelists want us to understand, right? So the Bible doesn't tell us everything about Jesus. It simply tells us what we need to know, right? Uh, and so we get glimpses of him here in the gospels. We get to see him in Revelation. We hear, see him talked about in the Old Testament and in the epistles and stuff like that. But we don't get to see everything about him, right? And then like, so if I'm going to go preach about Jesus and if I'm going to preach from the gospels, well, as a preacher or as a teacher, I have to limit what I say to what the Bible teaches. Because if I'm going to speak authoritatively regarding the word of God, I don't really have the opportunity to explore beyond that because I don't want to lead people astray. Um, and if you're in other works of art, like if you're painting a picture of Jesus, well, you can explore things to an extent, but you don't get to explore the full range of what Jesus was, right? You might be able to, in a single isolated image, depict anguish or emotion on Jesus' face that somebody hadn't previously considered. But through the form of art and visual storytelling that they are going about in the show, um, they're really allowing Christians the opportunity to explore what did it look, look like to truly be truly God, truly man. Uh, and sometimes they might be right. Sometimes they might be wrong. But what I'm saying is that I think it's a good opportunity as the body of Christ because it allows us to explore things theologically, but in a guarded manner right? So they're not just being wildly speculative here, and they're not just trying to make people mad by being blasphemous or something. They're not doing that. But what they're doing is they're saying, okay, well, here's what the Bible tells us. Now let's explore these possibilities, right? And sometimes that'll be controversial, right? Back in season two, I think about, you know, whenever Jesus is practicing for a sermon, right? So many people got upset about that, but that's a perfect example to me of how this show gives us the opportunity to reflect on things theologically. And I saw that a lot in these two episodes, right? Where there's things that they do with the character of Jesus or with the disciples that really just allows you to wrestle with what it genuinely would have been like to be the God man, Jesus, or to be one of his followers. And the reason why that's such a positive to me is because first off, I think it's beneficial to the body of Christ. I think that that's really cool. I, I think there's a time and place for us to do that. Um, and I don't think a sermon is the time and place, but I think that art is the perfect place to do that. As long as you are guarded in how you go about it and you're wise and discerning in it. Um, but in addition to that, um, I, I think that, what was I going to say? Mm, I was heading somewhere with that, but I don't remember exactly where I was heading. Um, that, man, that's going to frustrate me. There, there was something else about that that I was going to say. Mm, I was, uh, you know, don't you hate it whenever your mind just goes blank? There was something else I was going to say about that. But um, just long story short, I think that that theological reflection is very, very useful, right? I think that it's a cool thing and it's a good opportunity um, and, oh, that's, this is what I was going to say. I was going to say that this is, to me, what The Chosen exists for, right? Like, if you think about why why is it called The Chosen, right? Why is it not called The Jesus Story? Why is it not called The Gospels Adapted to Screen? It's called The Chosen because it is supposed to be a fictional exploration of what it looked like to be a follower of Jesus in the first century, right? It's not going to be a one-for-one -one biblical adaptation. And I think that when those fictional explorations are at their best is when they're actually wrestling through what it looked like to follow Jesus and tangentially what it looked like to be Jesus. I think that's really cool. And I just appreciate that. And I think in these two um, episodes, as it gets more emotional and as you see the weight being placed upon Jesus and the disciples, um, they just get to explore more things. And I just think that's really, really cool. Uh, and so there's that. Uh, I've got one more pro and then we will um, go into the um, cons. Uh, the cons I can address very briefly. Then I'll do the ranking very briefly as well. Uh, okay, let's see. I like how they string pearls just with visual with the sheep and oil. Yep. Um, the interaction with the Pharisees and Sadducees in the temple and Caiaphas was brilliantly written. We'll talk about that. Yes. Um, I love these episodes. We are going to see it tomorrow. So excited it came to our small town in northern Nevada. Very cool. I hope you enjoy it. You should come back here and tell us about it after you've seen it. Um, you're about to break through 100 viewers. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, love your background. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I like the background as well. It depicted the frustration that Jesus had as a human. Uh, we would have trying to communicate cannot be understood. Yes, that is, Um, I, I talked about it a little bit in my previous three uh, episode discussion um, last, or two weeks ago, I guess, 
Um, but I really like how they depict his frustration. We'll talk about that again tonight. In seven and eight, a lot of the Bible is so amazing, but I realized I love to see all the actors. Um, yes, absolutely. Your explanation of the value of exploring Jesus over and over, over and above what we have in the Bible is terrific. I want to share that with others. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, it helps us all follow in his steps to see Jesus tempted at all points. We are fully human, though one with God. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I just I really appreciated all that. Okay, final uh pro uh is really just something that I've already said in all six of these pros before, is just the season as a whole, right? Uh, my seventh pro is that these two episodes continued what the first six episodes set up. Uh, and as a result, this season is a great season of the show. Uh, once again, I'm going to have to rewatch them once they come out on the app to really figure out where I'd rank them. Um, but without a doubt, I can say that I like this season more than seasons two and three. And I like seasons two and three quite a bit, right? If I was going to rank them, I would say it's season one, season two, season three. But season four is up there with season one. Right. I'm going to have to rewatch it again and kind of work my way through it. Um, season one, I think, has such a pl special place in my heart because of the simplicity behind all of it. And even though it was a little bit lower budget, it um, I, I think I like when things are a little bit lower budget sometimes. Uh, I think there's a beauty to that. But I also think it's beautiful whenever you have a Christian show that becomes so high budget like this. Um, but also nostalgia wise, season one's where it all began. And so I really like that one. Um, but once I watch season four a few more times, it might it might beat it out. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if where they're heading, like if they can do it well, I could just see the show getting better from here because they're getting into the part of the gospels that I myself love um, talking about. Um, in, in, the, in the past, I have written um, manuscripts, um, like, like of books, because I've always wanted to write books. I don't know if I'll ever get to it on this side of eternity, but I've always wanted to write books. And um, there's this like trilogy of historical fiction novels that I've always wanted to write focused on the death and resurrection of Jesus. And in the past, I have written out manuscripts of those books. Uh, and I was actually just a few months ago working on a new manuscript, rewriting one of them. Uh, but then I ended up getting busy. And so I had to put that to the side. Um, but we are currently getting to the parts of the Jesus story that I am so passionate about. Uh, I'm passionate about all of it, obviously, but specifically something about the, um, the death and resurrection of Jesus, that particular part right there, just the narrative of it has been so compelling to me. And so I wouldn't be surprised if later seasons become my favorite just because of um, if, if they adapt the later seasons like they've adapted these season, uh, this season in particular, then I can imagine those seasons being my favorite. Uh, but yeah, my seventh pro is just the season as a whole because I thought that this season as a whole was really, really, really well done. It's not to say I didn't have my problems with it. I had really the only problem I had with season uh, was episode three. Um, just the end, really, that was just the ending of episode three. Um, but as a whole, I thought it was a fantastic fantastic season. And so those are my, those are my seven pros. Let me look at y'all's live chat once again, and then I will give you my two cons and my ranking. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the only con I saw was the image of the lion on David's shield and clasp and the graven images on the fireplace in the intro. Okay. Yeah. We'll talk about that. Um, don't you just love it? How the chosen has humor. I do like that. Uh, and I like how the humor was handled in this season a lot better than last season. Um, cause I don't know. Like I, I love humor in shows. Uh, I just don't like whenever the humor feels like it takes away from the um, from the from the actual story itself. And in season three, I felt like the humor kind of it almost had like that Marvel like effect, where like every time things were getting tense, it felt like there was like a humor to kind of cut away. And I'm not saying it happened every time, uh, but I thought that in this season, um, the humor was a lot more balanced. But that also could just be my preference for storytelling, because as we're getting to darker material, there's going to be a little bit less joking around. Uh, and so, um, I think that, that there's, I think this, this season was a nice balance of that for sure. Okay. So there were my seven pros. I only have two cons. And before I even say them, I just have to give a clarification that, um, these are very small, right? These are nitpicky. They are not a big deal. Whereas my seven pros are like high recommendations, five stars, five stars, five stars. My cons are literally just two tiny little nitpicky things that are not a big deal at all. Um, the first one is how episode seven began and or was it episode seven? Yes. How episode seven began and ended. Um, I don't think it's much of a, I don't think it's much of a spoiler to say this because they've done this plenty in the show. Cause I'm not going to tell what exactly happened, but there was a flash forward scene. All right. There was a flash forward scene at the beginning of episode seven and at the end of episode seven, kind of bookending it. And something about it just felt off to me. And we're, I mean, that's going to be the first thing we talk about whenever we get to the spoiler discussion. So you will get to hear my thoughts on it in just a second. But um, I don't know, something about it just, it didn't, something felt weird to me. And I don't know if y'all felt that as well. Um, I, I enjoyed the scene. I enjoyed, I, and I saw what they were going for with it. And 
Um, I, I really appreciated it in the end, but something about it felt a little bit off and I, I really can't even put my finger on it because I really just haven't stopped and reflected on it enough. And I'd really just like to see the episode again before I can give like in-depth thoughts, but something about it felt a little bit off. And so there, that was one con. And then my second con um, actually has to do with Thomas's story arc, uh, which is interesting because we were just talking about how amazing Joey is in playing Thomas. Uh, and I think he does a fantastic job. And I would agree that his acting chops are amazing in the season, but I, I just, I also feel weird about the whole story arc. Like I see what they're doing with it. Um, uh, I think my main concern with his story arc is just where we're at in the timeline of the show, right? Because we know where the season ends. Um, it's basically we're, we're like, I mean, it's not a spoiler to say we're one week away from Jesus's crucifixion. Right. I mean, we are like less than a week away, actually, if you're just thinking about the events. Right. We're, we're like five days away from Jesus crucifixion. Uh, yes, we might have a whole season in between and stuff like that. But I, I think it's just like it. I, I think this is from an artistic perspective. Right. Once again, because the, the creators of the show, they can do whatever they want with the character. And I'm not going to spoil what they've done in case you haven't seen the episodes. But there are just certain things where. I don't know, from an artistic perspective, as I consider the thing as a whole, and this could be me just, you know, reading the biblical stuff into it, and I know I need to let the show be the show. But if we're talking about these people being the followers of Jesus, I, I'm okay with there being a lot of confusion and frustration and um, d disappointment, I think, right? Uh, because, I mean, that's, how, that's what we experience nowadays as followers of Jesus. Uh, I get the relatability behind it. Um, but... To me, I think whenever you just consider like Thomas's story arc so far and where he's left at at the end of the season, and you're just thinking that there's only five days where Jesus crucified, I think from a narrative perspective, because I, I know that I know the resolution, right? Because we know where this story is heading because we've read the gospels. We know what's going to happen after Jesus raises and stuff, but it sets Thomas on a really dark trajectory. And whenever you consider his story arc over the course of the whole show, I just feel like we haven't seen enough time with him as a devoted like like i just like i don't want okay this isn't a spoiler because whenever you think of thomas you think of doubting thomas right let me just say he's experiencing like a, a lot of doubt in the season right so that's not spoiling anything because we're just seeing the seeds planted there that's fine right so we're seeing a lot of doubt here and i think that my one con is that as i think about the show as a whole we haven't seen like i mean we've seen him since season one and seen in through seasons two and three but to me season four is where you really get to this see the disciples blossom but it's right then that you get to see Thomas's doubts planted, which to me is like kind of almost frustrating because it's like, ah, so like, is Thomas's blossoming only going to come at the end? I don't know. Because like, we really haven't get, gotten to see what makes him an apostle like the others, right? Uh, and I don't know, once I've, once we walk through the episodes themselves, maybe y'all will be able to talk me out of that because um, this is more just me thinking out loud. And um, this is something where my opinion on it isn't nearly as strong as at the end of episode three, what happened there? Um, my opinion is totally capable of being changed here. This was just something that I kept getting struck with while I was watching the episodes. Every time it would cut to Thomas, you got to see Joey giving this A plus performance, but I was like, man, this poor guy, like things are not going to get better for a while. Like basically seasons four, five and six are going to be rough for Thomas and it's not going to get better until season seven. And I was like, Hmm, like, like if that's where they're heading with them. So I don't know. I'll be interested to see. Because if you're just thinking timeline wise, they've only got five days and where he's left here, you don't just recover from that over the course of five days. Uh, and so I, I don't know. I'm, I'm very intrigued to see where they head with it. Um, but that was the one thing where just, I think from an artistic perspective, just like watching, I was like, what are they doing with this character? I, I really want to know. Like I, I can see where they're heading, but the, the depths to which they're going in order to get there is very intriguing to me. And so I, I want to hear y'all's thoughts on that whenever we get there. Okay. Let me look here and then I'll just give you my um, rankings and then we will go into spoiler discussion. Uh, let's see. Um, I think they are rushing the final week. I wish there was more teaching miracles first. Uh, yeah. I, I really, I'm sure that once we get there, it'll be fine, but I will agree that. Um, yeah. It, it, it feels weird to me that we're only, we only just passed the halfway point of the show and we're already getting to the final week. I know that the gospels spend a lot of time on the final week of Jesus, but they also share a lot more about what happened before then. Right. So it does feel a bit rushed to me. Um, I always thought that it was going to be basically um, seasons one through five would be the ministry of Jesus. And then season six and seven, like I thought season six would be um, passion week and the death. And then season seven would be the resurrection. That's, that's how I always figured it. 
Um, but then they had announced that it wasn't like that. Okay, sorry. I missed someone back here. Agree on the episode 7 flash forward scene. It felt off. I want to rewatch it again. Okay, cool. I'm not a fan of the Thomas story arc, but for me, he was the star of the season. His actors are fantastic. Yes, I, I really agree with this point right here um, because like, I, I can create this division, right? I'm not a big fan of the story arc itself, but I cannot deny the, the beauty of the writing and the beauty of the acting, right? And so I appreciate what they're doing. I'm just not a per like from a subjective perspective, from a subjective perspective, I'm not a big fan of the story arc, right? And so um, that division is definitely possible. Um, there was something about it, not, not something I ever imagined, for sure. Uh, let's see here. Oh, oh, we got a lot of comments. Sorry, I need to catch up. I like the Thomas story arc. I had thought about it that I'll share in the spoiler section. Okay, very cool. In the season three finale, Thomas actually had a lot of faith. Um, yes, Thomas is angry at this point, so. Well, no, and, and I get that, right? Like, so, sorry, going back to that. I get why Thomas is angry, and I empathize with it. That's what I'm saying. I understand the acting, and I understand the writing behind it. I'm just personally from a subjective perspective, not a fan of how far they're taking it. Because I think also to me, I've always thought Thomas got a bad rap as doubting Thomas. Um, and if you ever watch my like lives of the apostles series that I made a few years back, if you go watch the video on Thomas, you'll understand why <laughs> I think that he sometimes gets a bad rap. Um, and I think that this is just contributing to that, to where people are going to leave this thing. Oh, doubting Thomas. And I get that they're just kind of embracing that. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. Okay. I don't think it's a spoiler. I was expecting more of a relationship between Jesus and John, the beloved disciple. Um, yeah, yeah. To me, it seems like in many ways, Matthew in the God, it, like in the chosen, Matthew is kind of replaced. Like he's taken John's role um, to where Matthew seems to be almost the beloved disciple who has a closer relationship with Jesus than anybody else. Um, it will be the resurrection that changes Thomas. Uh, it kind of makes sense about Thomas because we know about Judas falling off course and Peter denying Jesus. So it's possible that other disciples like Thomas went on a questionable path. No, I agree. Like I, I understand like, I do agree that the disciples weren't always on board with what Jesus did. That's hundred percent true. And you see that in the gospels. Um, I just think it's interesting the depths to which they're taking him, especially because we've only seen glimpses of him at like high points and we're only a week removed from the death. Like to me, like where we leave off with him here, I'm wondering how he's still going to be with Jesus by the end of season five. If I'm being entirely honest uh, without spoiling anything. Um, isn't Dallas saying he's going to do a couple of indie movies. Maybe they'll pick up some missed stories. Um, yeah, so he said they're going to do some independent movies. Um, I don't know what that's going to look like. I don't know if those movies are going to be like part of the season to where it's like, you know, maybe they just like do, you know, two episodes of season five will just be like full length movies or what. Um, but I, I hope that they like, that'd be great. I want to flash back to the baptism. I want like, you know, there's just stuff I'm always going to hope for, but um, I don't know what they're going to do there. I like that more actors took part of the scene, especially when they were on the road instead of the few the same. Yeah, I think it's always good whenever they give other actors an opportunity to do some work. Thomas's arc, perhaps to highlight the immense impact of the resurrection. Yes, like I, that's 100% why they're doing it. And that's once again where I'm saying like, I get where they're heading. I just subjectively disagree. Like, not even disagree. I'm just not a big fan of it, right? If that makes sense, right? I mean, th and this is true in any story, like in any TV show I watch, right? It's not just the Bible shows. It's like any show, you know, there's just like some storylines you're not a big fan of. I feel like that's what I'm experiencing with Thomas's arc. And that's not to take away from the actor or the writing. It's all really well done. It's just not really my cup of tea. <laughs> I've got a cup of tea here in case you didn't know that. Okay. I cried when he quoted scripture. Uh, I cry when they feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. I wanted much to jump and just holler. Would you please listen to him? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Remembering his smile during season two, episode one, flash forward. That's true, right? Um, the Whenever you have Thomas smiling during the, um, when talking about Jesus, that that that's really cool. That's a good thought right there. I'll make Thomas's later confession after the resurrection more impactful, my Lord and my God. I agree. Yeah. So like in the end, the storyline will pay off from an artistic perspective. Like, like once again, I get where they're heading. It's just one thing. I was like, eh, okay, it's fine. And by drawing emphasis to this, I feel like it's making it seem like my opinions about it are stronger than they actually are. Um, this was more just, like I said, these are just nitpicks, right? I'm not that passionate about this. Uh, it's more just like, oh yeah. Um, that is just, as I was watching the episodes, every time I cut back to Thomas, I was like, oh my gosh, this is like intense. <laughs> uh, Thomas, when I was interviewing him, uh, really surprised how they did, John 6? Yes, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, the Thomas story is definitely a shock you never think of for sure. I wonder if the Thomas arc will involve Rhema in some way related to Matthew 23, 53. Uh, I've seen a lot of people say that. I doubt that Rhema is going to be one of the resurrected saints. Uh, honestly, I doubt that they're going to even show that in the show. I mean, they, they might do it, but um, since those are such hotly debated verses, I would doubt that they're going to even show that, but they could. Uh, they could. I don't know. Uh, okay, so uh, real quick, final thing before we go to spoiler section. Um, my, um, my ranking of these episodes, there's two episodes, episode seven, episode eight, and here's my controversial opinion. I actually liked episode eight more. 
Uh, which is interesting because from most of the fan discussion I've seen, people liked episode seven more, but I actually liked episode eight more. Uh, I, I thought episode seven was good. I liked both these episodes. Um, I liked every single episode of this season um, with the exception of the half, the second half of episode three. <laughs> I love the first half of episode three. Um, so I loved seven and a half episodes of the season. And I thought that almost each episode improved on the last. Uh, I think I liked oh, so the first three episodes. I think I ranked it like one, two, three or something like that. But then it was like each episode, I just thought got better and better. And um, I just thought episode eight was such a good finale. Uh, I mentioned this once again in my out of theater reaction. I thought it was the hands down best finale the show's had so far uh, to where the finale was consistent with what the season set up. And I thought that was absolutely, uh, absolutely fantastic. And so, yeah, so I would love to see what y'all thought uh, when it comes to that ranking. But that being said, I have talked long enough. Spoiler free discussion. Let me um, just warn you right now. And let me just put this on here so that you can see this. Spoilers are coming ahead. And in case you did not know that was happening, it now says spoilers down here as well, right? And so if you're watching this and you do not want to be spoiled, let me just warn you that spoilers are coming. And so please <laughs> get off the video. But if you don't mind spoilers, then let's hop in to spoilers for episode seven. Okay, so let me just pull up my notes right here and let me take a sip of tea and then we will hop in to episode seven. Mm. Oh, I forgot. Actually, I actually have two glasses of tea. One of them is in the little chosen thing. That's kind of cool. So not little. Um, okay, so episode seven, what we're going to do is I'm not going to go play by play through here. Um, but since Brienne is not with us tonight, I figured we could probably cover a little bit more just because I'm not going to be going back and forth with her. Oh, William Feather said goodbye. All right, goodbye. Please come back after you've seen the episodes. Um, okay, we're going to walk through episode seven. And since Brienne's not here, um, I figured I could talk about some more since we're not going back and forth. And so let's start with the beginning of episode seven. Uh, and actually where I wanted to start with all this is actually before episode seven even began with that little Brady Bunch styled intro that they did. Um, you know, where it was like all the, um, I don't even remember what all they were talking about, but you know, with all the cast members just like talking back and forth and stuff. I thought that was really fun. Um, they've had like little intro things before each of the episodes in the theater, but this one was just like, I, I literally like, I actually verbally laughed and in a, in a movie, it takes a lot to make me verbally laugh. Usually I just have like the extra air coming out of my nose where I'm like, hmm, you know, but I was actually, I actually laughed out loud watching this. And I know that there was like this woman sitting like two seats down from me. She was cackling the whole time. And I just thought it was really fun. And so I just figured I'd mention that because I thought the little Brady Bunch intro at the beginning with all that was just uh, really cool. And even the way they edited it was really fun with like when the one person spilled the popcorn and it fell and stuff. I just thought that was a um, really, really cool. Uh, so I really like that, but let's go into the episode proper. Uh, episode seven begins, and we get to see this mysterious figure walking up a mountain and going into a cave uh, where he is confronted by a woman with a bow and arrow. And it turns out this is Matthew, right? And this is a flash forward scene. It didn't tell us what year it was because it was trying to give us that suspense. Um, but this is presumably later on in time than we have seen so far, right? So this is... Um, I'm assuming it's after even what we saw in the messengers in the Christmas special, because I believe in the messengers that we were told that little James was alive still. Um, I, I, I don't remember exactly there, um, but we do learn in this flash forward scene that little James has died. He was impaled with a spear um, in lower Egypt by King Hyrcanus, uh, which once again, you can go read about all those traditions. Uh, if you go look at my lives of the apostle series, where we talk about little James, um, but we, we have this entire flash forward scene. And really what this is doing is it's setting forward, it's setting up the scene at the end of the episode where we actually have Math, uh, Mary reading to Matthew a psalm or a poem that she has written um, about Jesus, right? And I, I feel bad because as we go to the spoiler section, I'm going to immediately start off with a negative. But I did mention in my cons that this was one of my cons. And once again, it's not like a huge con because ultimately I liked the scene, but it, to me, this is one of those things that felt staged, right? Which obviously the whole show is staged. It's being acted out. But this in particular, something about it felt off. I think it was like this, the set in the cave. It just didn't feel like a real cave. And for all I know, they filmed it in an actual cave. Um, but it, something about it just felt off. And I don't know if it was the makeup or something, something about it just felt like I was watching actors on a screen rather than watching real life people playing out things. And that's okay. Because once again, they are actors on a screen and it's okay for stuff like that to happen. But 
I think I, as I was watching it, I was more just like, where's this heading? And as I thought about it, I was like, oh yeah. Whenever they released that first trailer, Mary had quoted this very poetic like monologue that we haven't seen in the show so far. I bet that this scene is setting up for that to show up at the end of the episode. And that's exactly what they did. And once again, I, I, the monologue is really good, right? Because that's like at the very end, like that's where she talks about like, you know, darkness is not dark to Jesus and stuff. And it's like a Psalm reflecting on him and like his death and resurrection and stuff like that. It's a really good monologue. It just felt kind of out of place. Right. And um, I, I really don't know. Once again, I don't have the words to articulate this by myself. That's why I wish Brianne was here. So we could be talking back and forth and maybe we could like put our finger on it. Um, I think my issue is that it more felt like, you know, like whenever during the Christmas specials, how they used to have those monologues, it felt like they had a really good monologue about the death of Jesus and they wanted to shoehorn it into the episode. And <laughs> they were like, cause, cause the thing is, it, it, it's a really good monologue, right? I mean, you're, re- you're like, you're listening to it at the end of the episode. You're like, wow, this is good. I like what she's saying here. This is kind of profound. I want to munch on that and reflect on it, but it just didn't feel like, and, and you see how it ties into the Lazarus stuff, but something about it just felt like a little bit off to me to where it just felt like it was there just to get to that scene um, where all of it, like, like even like how she kind of got defensive about like seeing like her writing, like, like whenever Matthew said, Oh yeah, I saw that you have like writing over there. She kind of got defensive as a person who loves writing. I get that because sometimes like, I don't know when you share writing with somebody, it's like, you're like revealing your heart to them and stuff. And it's a bit, a bit weird, but something about the whole scene, just like something felt off. And I don't know if it was just the setup of it or the acting or something, but something about it was just kind of weird to me. Um, once again, maybe if I rewatch it, I won't feel as weird about it. Um, but just from my first reaction, it felt off. And once again, I hate to be starting with such a negative thing because everything else I'm going to say is pretty much positive other than the Thomas stuff. But um, yeah, let me see what y'all have to say about this. Uh, I don't like the implication that Mary had written scripture. That's what it felt like to me. Well, so I don't think they're saying that she wrote scripture. Um, I, okay, I will say that. Um, so I'm currently teaching apologetics to my students. And um, in one of our classes, I had them read the non-canonical heretical book, The Gospel of Mary Magdalene right? Because I was just wanting them to look at it and see how bogus it was. <laughs> and as soon as they had her writing stuff down, I was like, oh no, <laughs> they're going to bring up the gospel of Mary Magdalene. I didn't actually think that, but that's what, like humorously, that's what went through my mind. I was like, oh my gosh, what if they suggest that Mary wrote scripture? They're not suggesting she wrote scripture. They're simply saying that she wrote and she was reflecting on things, right? And um, that's something I do, right? I mean, I have a journal where I reflect on things, but I'm not claiming that my writings are scripture. It suggested that that's what Mary's doing. Um, I thought the flash forward Mary didn't look old enough and the bow and arrow lady made it feel like Lord of the Rings. Yeah. The bow and arrow. I feel like I was watching like Lord of the Rings meets like that Disney movie brave or whatever. (laughs) It was kind of strange. Uh, and I didn't totally understand who that woman was. I think they said her name at one point. I might've even wrote it in my notes. Um, but yeah, like it was, it was kind of weird. I didn't know if she was like a disciple or like a bodyguard or something. It was strange. Uh, Mary's poem. That's the narration we heard in season four preview early on. Yes. Yeah. So that, that was like that. The, I started processing that as we were going through, like whenever we got to the flash forward at the beginning, I was like, Oh, this is setting up the thing that we heard in the trailer Um, from Mississippi love the chosen. Uh, There are a lot of pseudo gospels floating around. And this reminded me of that. Yeah. um, Once again, there is a gospel of Mary Magdalene that you can go check out and it's, it's a weird one. (laughs) Uh, And so I was like, Oh, like it's just kind of strange. And um, I can just see somebody like watching this and be like, I didn't know Mary Magdalene wrote something. And then they're going to go on Google and look it up. And they're going to come across the gospel of Mary Magdalene and be like, Whoa, <laughs> they're going to be in for a wild night when they read that. Um, the only thing I was thinking during the opening was why was Mary Magdalene in a cave? Oh, because she's not mentioned in the book of Acts or the epistles. Yeah. I mean, I, the idea is that they're in hiding, right? And so they're in hiding, but she had like a full setup in there. Uh, I don't know. That was a very interesting cave. Um, the girl dressed like Robin Hood in the cave was odd to me. Yeah. It was just all strange. Um, I'm sure they had reasons for it. Um, it just was, a, uh, yeah. And also the idea of, I don't know, you've got this like woman who is apparently a disciple, but like her first thing is she like comes out with like a bow and arrow knocked, right? Like she immediately took like the offensive, I guess. Like that was strange because I don't know if Christians would have reacted that way necessarily. Um, cause they're all about like per- being like suffering and dying to death, not pro- really fighting for themselves, but I don't know. Um, seems slightly off. Um, I thought she'd throw pages in the fire after she read them. Oh, that would have been interesting. <laughs> It's obviously not scripture. I agree. You can really see the research they did. Um, I took it as everyone that came into contact with Jesus during that time wrote something down, not gospel, but things they want to remember. But yeah, I mean, that would be kind of cool. Um, I have seen The Chosen. Good. I'm glad you've seen The Chosen, Jeffrey. 
I love the spoilers. The more I hear them, the more I want to go watch on the big screen. There you go. Well, good, because we're going to get into some good spoilers right here. Uh, Mary's poem was beautiful. I will agree with that. Um, I, I, once again, it's almost like somebody wrote a poem and they're like, this is so good. Let's craft a scene around it, <laughs> which is, that's fine. Uh, were they saying little James had a wife and kids? Uh, don't know the tradition around him. They did say that, right? Um, so they did mention that little James had a wife and kids. Like, they didn't specifically say that, but they said, how are so-and-so and the kids doing? And it implies that little James did get married, which is cool um, because that's very plausible. And um, you'd have to, once again, I don't remember if there are traditions around little James having kids. I, I don't believe there were, right? So I think that was just a fictional embellishment. Um, I think the only person that we know might have had kids was Philip. Oh, other than like Simon Peter, right? But Philip, they're like, people think he might have been married, but people also get Philip mixed up with another Philip in scripture. Uh, let's see. Okay. I might not be able to like go through all of these, but let's see. Uh, she thrown in the fire. It wouldn't have helped. Um, it was a fast forward. Matthew lost behavior patterns. I noticed. Um, yeah, he seemed, well, he just seemed more like um, sociable, right? Uh, and he's, I think he's just more comfortable around Mary. I saw it this afternoon, thoroughly amazed. I don't have an issue with Mary writing something. I don't think they were saying it was scripture. Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with her writing things. Um, yeah, it, it was interesting that she called it like a psalm though, because it was definitely structured different than a psalm. Um, it, it was just like a, a classic poem. Doesn't Catholic tradition say that she went to France, not a cave in the Middle East? Uh, I don't even know. I haven't looked into Catholic tradition in regards to Mary. Um, I, I don't remember what exactly they've said about her. Maybe eventually I'll look into that, but I don't know. Okay. So, um, I just wanted to share something a little bit about that, um, fast forward scene. I don't really have much more to say about it beyond that. Um, next thing that I want to talk about is, um, let's see, what do we have here? Um, they begin, so they, oh, I, I like that it was really cool how Simon Z was like making walking staff for everybody. I thought that was really sweet. Simon Z's, he's pretty cool. Simon Z's had a good, like, He's had a bunch of really good scenes in this season. You really see him growing as a disciple, but he's more like in the background growing as a disciple. Um, you get to see an interaction between Thomas and John where Thomas just admits that he really just doesn't. Um, I'm like, like, like Th John asks Thomas, hey, what was with that comment about let's go down and die with Lazarus? And Thomas just explains how like if he died, he wouldn't have to feel anything. And that's one of the darkest comments that the show's ever given. Um But if you've ever gone through grief, you probably understand that because it's not him saying he is suicidal. It's simply him reflecting on his grief and being like, like that's just sometimes where like your grief is like, man, this pain is terrible, right? To where it's not saying that he wants to die. He's just saying sometimes like, but it, it you know, it's like he, he just wants to escape the feelings and it, it feels like, oh, that'd be the only way to do it. But he's not saying that's what he wants to happen, right? It's almost like he has like a fatalistic approach to things and it's very, very dark. Um, hello, Against the Current, a chosen podcast. Um I like the way the intro tied into the final monologue, but I think the opening scene went on a tiny bit too long. Maybe they have a plan for it, though. Yeah, I was wondering if maybe there's like a plan for where they're heading with all this. Um, does it seem like Mary was perhaps supposed to be somewhere in Europe, maybe even Britannia? That kind of explained the girl that came across if she were a Celt or something. She did seem very Celt-like, but um, it, I don't know. I have no idea. As for marriage for the disciples, don't we have the right to take the leading wife with us? Um, yes. So uh, in Corinthians, Paul does mention that the disciples um, got married and stuff like that. So I have no problem with that. Um, okay, so uh, let's see more and more, more stuff. Um, Nathaniel and Judas, right. They have a conversation that, so as they're traveling and they're making their way slowly, but surely down to like Bethany to go visit Lazarus, uh, or I guess not down to Bethany cause they're coming from Perea to, uh, across the Jordan and stuff to Bethany. Um, as they're heading there, you get to see conversations between all sorts of the disciples and Nathaniel and Judas have a fun conversation. Cause Nathaniel, once again, he's very blunt. And, um, as they're talking, um, he mentions that things were quieter before Judas. And at first that's a joke because he's saying Judas talks a lot. Um, but he begins to explain that Jesus wasn't as prominent, right? And so um, really Judas has only known Jesus once Jesus is in the limelight. Uh, and so Nathaniel and Judas begin talking about this. And um, really what Judas mentions is that he says they're on their way to their third Shiva, right? Because I mean, we've had John the Baptist die. We've had um, Rama die. And then now we have had... Um, who, who, like they're going to, oh, Lazarus died. <laughs> I was trying to figure out who died. Lazarus died, right? And so they're, they're going to Lazarus as Shiva. And he says like, this can't be what true glory looks like. And I love that Nathaniel responds and says, only Jesus knows what true glory looks like. Um, that's a good like allusion to like, you know, like Nathaniel and Jesus' first interaction, um, you know, where, you know, Jesus says like, I saw you under the fig tree. And he says like, you believe this, you're going to see greater stuff than this. You'll see the angels ascending and descending. Uh, and, yeah, I just love that Nathaniel said only Jesus knows what true glory looks like. And that also seems to be an allusion to the beginning of the Gospel of John, where it says that no one has seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God has made him known, right? The idea that Jesus himself has seen glory, 
because he is the son of God and he is God in the flesh. And so uh, I just like that little illusion right there. Uh, all the conversations between the disciples were really, really good. Uh, jumping down a little bit further, um, we do get to see Mother Mary with the sisters, Martha and Mary. There's so many Marys in the show at this point. Um, at one point, there are literally three Marys in the same scene. <laughs> um, but that's just true of first century culture in general in Israel. But um, you have Mother Mary and the two sisters, and they are sitting in Shiva, and they are mourning, and you've got all the mourners around them. I love the inclusion of the mourners. Um, and I loved that they gave them the key saying that, like, basically Lazarus was rich and stuff um, because of all of his ironsmithing, which I thought he was a vineyard owner, but I guess he was an ironsmith, which we learned in this episode. Um, but I guess he had a lot of money to take care of, like, left behind, and it was to take care of the sisters and um, Mother Mary, which is really cool. Uh, and I love that they give them the key because this key is going to become prominent later on uh, when basically uh, Mary is going to give away all of their money <laughs> to go and buy this valuable ointment for Jesus. And um, I didn't see where they were heading with that whenever they handed the key off. But then slowly as the episode progressed, I was like, oh, OK, I see what they're setting up right here. And I thought that was really cool. I actually didn't expect them to adapt that um, the anointing of Jesus feet in these episodes, but they did it and they did it really well. Uh, and so that was really cool. Uh, let's see. Um, Thomas's heart was broken and death would be better for him than living without Rhema. Um, yeah, that's, that's what he feels like, right? Thomas was like to live as Christ to die as gain. I don't know if he was quite there um, because whenever Paul says to live as Christ to die as gain, um, he's saying that more in an optimistic perspective because he wants to be with Jesus. Um, I think Thomas right now is saying, I want to get away from Jesus and I just want to stop feeling this pain. Um, I think that's really what Thomas is saying. And so it's a little bit more negative. The writing was great. The acting was so good. Joey that plays Thomas did a wonderful job. Um, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. I think they're talking to the audience when they so often direct anyone who has a question, just ask Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of what they're telling us to do as well. Uh, okay. So um, eventually um, the sisters learn that, Mar that Jesus is coming. And so Martha immediately like runs out there to go see Jesus. And really it's during these scenes where we get to see how dark of a place Thomas is at. And this is going to get worse and worse over the course of these episodes. Um, I literally, in my notes, I just put Thomas is shook because Thomas, as they're going down there, he's trying to process what the heck Jesus means when he says Lazarus is asleep and he's going to wake up because Jesus clarified that Lazarus is dead. And from Thomas's perspective, he's thinking like he's never seen Jesus resurrect anybody. He doesn't know Jesus can do that, but he knows that's what Jesus is claiming. And he's coming. He's trying to reconcile. He's like, OK, if we go down there. Like, it's almost like he's hoping Jesus can't resurrect somebody, right? That's what he's hoping, right? Because he's hoping that Jesus fails because then at least Rama wouldn't, have, like, if, if Rama died, that's what had to happen. Whereas right here, it's like, what, what they're exploring with Thomas, with Thomas is very, int like, interesting from, like, a, um, from a mental and a philosophical perspective, right? Like, just what they're exploring. I'm not a big fan of the story arc, but if you're just stepping into the character's mindset, he's traumatized and... I mean, it really does make Jesus look kind of weird from his perspective. And once again, Jesus is God. So his ways are different than our ways, right? But from Thomas's perspective, I mean, he's dreading this because if Jesus does resurrect Lazarus, then Thomas is going to be like, why didn't you do that for Rhema? Why do you pick and choose? And sure enough, that's where this episode's going, right? And so that's what Thomas is going to be frustrated about. Uh, and, and that's what this whole thing's setting up. And you can just see the dread in Thomas's eyes and like the makeup department did a great job. And Joey did a great job where he just looks dead. And every time it cuts to him, uh, like it, 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 that, that, that's where his acting is so good because it's like, every time it cuts to him, he doesn't really have to do much. He just stands there. But every time it cuts to him, you can just see him sinking into more and more like darkness to where, I mean, like he was making the comments about how he feels like he wants to stop feeling things. If I had a friend who looked like Thomas does in these episodes, I would be on, like, like we would have him on Suicide Watch. Like, we would be watching out for him being like, okay, we need to make sure this guy doesn't harm himself because he looks rough. And I also like the brilliant idea they had with the show, like, just from a costuming perspective. Like, the bright and vibrant colors he once wore are now muted, right? And so uh, it looks like the cloak has, like, the same design, but it's just, like, a darker variation of the cloak, right? And so he just, like, he literally has, like, he's embodying darkness. It's just from a... From a visual perspective, it's very striking. And so we get to see a lot of what's going on with Thomas there. Once again, I'm not a huge fan of that story arc, but I do find it very intriguing, if that makes sense. Um, let's see. Where do I go to watch season four? Seriously? Um, if you want to go watch season four, you um, can go to a local theater. Um, just go Google it, and um, hopefully they will 
um, have it. If not, I don't know. But soon it'll be on, on the show's now. Um, the stage of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Thomas is cycling in the first four stages. Hey, late, but glad to be here. Glad to have you here. These last two episodes were amazing. Uh, yes, you can watch that in movie theater. We'll cry. Uh, none other than Simon, James, and John have acknowledged of Jairus, the daughter being raised by Jesus previously. Yeah, exactly. So only those three know that Jesus can resurrect, but Thomas is dreading the possibility. And it, they can see it in his eyes, right? They're like, ooh, like this is not going to go well. Uh, and it does add an intriguing like just aspect to these episodes. Like every time Jesus does something good, they have to look over at Thomas to see how he's going to react. Cause this guy is teetering on the edge. Like it's a, it's a very dark place. Um, there have been three major deaths, Peter and Eden's baby, John the Baptist, Rama. Well, and Lazarus, but um, Lazarus doesn't die. Um, no, it doesn't say dead. I think Thomas is representing everyone who says, how can a loving God allow suffering and struggles in darkness? But they, they did take it to the edge seriously. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, for sure. Uh, Okay, uh, let's see. My thought about Thomas uh, is that, um, wait, my thought about Thomas is are doing the thing this also to make Judas less obvious. Okay, I, I see what you're saying there. So you're, you're saying that they might be taking Thomas to this dark place so that they don't immediately just like point fingers at Judas whenever Jesus says somebody's going to betray him. That does make sense, right? Because, I mean, if you're thinking about it narratively, even in these episodes, Judas suggests that, right? Um, I will say that Judas doesn't come across looking very good at these episodes either. Uh, but that is an interesting idea. So maybe they're planting, um, they're planting Thomas as like a false positive, right? To where like, whenever Jesus says, one of you is, one of you is going to betray me, they're all thinking it's probably going to be Thomas. But the thing is, if <laughs> whenever they get to that scene, I don't know how Thomas wouldn't be like, it's obviously going to be me because even these episodes, Thomas is already thinking about like, like, he's like, I just don't want to be with this guy anymore. Really? <laughs> uh, to where like, he's getting frustrated. And so, like that, that's what I'm saying. Like from a narrative perspective, I'm wondering what they're going to do in season five, so that whenever you get to the scene around the like the table, where Jesus says one of you is going to betray me, I want to know why Thomas is going to find that so hard to believe because it says all of them denied it, and I guess you could say that Thomas denied it, but he didn't really mean it. Um, but I don't know. That's that, that's very interesting to me um, about uh, yeah. This is what they're doing there. Okay, so let's move on. Um, as they're heading down there, so so once they get there uh, and everybody's looking at Thomas, everybody's looking at Jesus, trying to figure out how Jesus is going to respond to this. And you get this brief little flashback of whenever Peter looks at Jesus, he specifically remembers Jesus crumbling the paper and dropping it. And I was wondering what y'all's opinion was. Like, what was the significance of having that flashback there? It almost seemed to me like Peter was having, like Peter has become more perceptive and he has greater insight to Jesus than other people. Because he had he alone had noticed Jesus holding that paper and crumbling it. And it's almost like he recognizes that Jesus has a plan here that people might not be privy to, right? To where he looks and he sees Jesus' reaction and he remembers Jesus crumbling the paper and dropping it down to where he knows that Jesus chose not to do anything. And it's almost like he's like trying to figure out, hmm, what's going on there? Uh, and so I'd be interested to hear what y'all's thoughts are there. Uh, let's see. Tom, um, Gingerella says, Thomas has much more reason to turn against Jesus, but he doesn't in the end. Judas does turn on him because he's not doing what Judas wants him to do. A much less valid reason, for sure. Um, my mom said, after some Judas comments, well, he's delusional. It's plain to see his expectations are going to be upended. Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, moving on, moving on. Let me just look through my notes here to see other stuff I wanted to talk about. Um, okay, so finally we get to the big moment of Jesus weeping. I thought how they portrayed this was great. Uh, in, in order to explain why I thought this was so great, maybe I should give you some backstory behind me and this one verse, right? Jesus wept is famously the most, the, the shortest verse in the entire English Bible. Uh, in Greek, there's actually a shorter verse. It's the one that says rejoice always. Um, but in English, the shortest verse is Jesus wept. And I remember one time I was in college and I was taking a, um, it was like a religion and philosophy class. Um, it didn't contribute to my major at all. It was just an elective I wanted to take. And I remember I was leaving the class and we had been talking about Jesus weeping or something in the class. Like we were talking about that passage, um, even though it wasn't a Christian class or anything like that. But since we were talking about religion, stuff like that came up and me and a friend, we were walking, this is A&M's campus. And we were just walking down the, um, the main walk there. And as we were talking, I was talking about that verse and me and her were having a discussion on like why Jesus wept. And I shared my thoughts about like why. And I said, I don't think he was weeping because he was grieving Lazarus's death. 
Um, even though I think that that death had a huge toll on him, right? I mean, we see his sadness throughout these episodes, for instance, right? I don't think that, like, I think Jesus' death, I mean, I think Lazarus's death had a toll on Jesus, but I don't think that's why the Gospel of John tells us Jesus wept, right? Because whenever you're reading the text itself, it seems to express that there's more to that, right? And so me and my friend, we were walking, we were talking about this, and I shared that I thought that Jesus was more grieved by the disbelief of the people around him, such as Martha and Mary and the mourners and all these people. And Lazarus's death was setting in mind his, like, you know, where this whole story was heading. And to me, that was my perspective on why Jesus wept. And there was this woman who was just like walking a little bit ahead of us um, as we were having this discussion. And I guess she was eavesdropping a little bit and she turned around and we were standing right outside the, um, the, Memorial Student Center. I remember this clear as day. She turns around and she starts yelling at me. And she says, you've never suffered because you're too young. Because this is a few years ago, right? She said, you're too young. You've never suffered anything. And if you did, you would know why Jesus wept. And it's because his friend had died. And I've been in church my entire life. And she like went on this like long rant at me, yelling at me like in public in front of everybody. And I was just shocked. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, I guess our conversation had stirred up something inside of her that I was not aware of. <laughs> um, and I disagreed with her, but I didn't think that was a time or place to do that. And so I just apologized that I'm so sorry, ma'am. I didn't realize that, you know, um, I like, I, I didn't mean to like trigger you or anything like that. Uh, and then she just like got mad and just like stormed off. Right. Long story short, I still disagree with her because I do think like, like, I think she was just coming from a place of hurt and I understand that. And, um, I guess that those words had like comforted her in a place and I don't know. Um, but I, I still do disagree with her. And I do think that when Jesus wept, it wasn't just because of Lazarus' death. It was because of the people around him not understanding what he was there to do and not understanding who he was. And I, like that's to me why Jesus wept, because it seems like that's what the biblical text, text is suggesting. And that's how they portrayed it in the show. And so as I was watching it, it was very cathartic. I was like, finally like even though to be fair other commentaries and stuff agree with me too <laughs> um but it was nice in the show like i'm glad that they took it that way right i'm glad that they chose to portray it how the gospels seem to portray it where jesus is not simply sad about the death of lazarus even though he is very sad about that right because this is his friend and later on he's going to apologize and say lazarus i'm sorry it had to go this way right I, I wish that i could have come and healed you sooner but it needed to be this way but i'm glad that how they portrayed it is like it's like jesus is overwhelmed and Jesus is looking around and he feels like, like it's like multiple different things all overwhelming him at the same time where he's like, he sees the sorrow that these women are going through and he knows that this sorrow is going to be short lived and it's going to give way to joy soon, but that doesn't take away the burden of their sorrow right now. And he knows that this whole story is heading to his own crucifixion where he is going to die. And he knows that all of that's happening as a result of sin. And so you have the burden of sin on him. And then you also have the disbelief of Mary and Martha, as they said, you could have been here and you could have saved him. And so you have the disbelief there and then you have the confusion of the disciples and all of this stuff just like on his shoulders to where it just breaks Jesus down and he weeps. I thought how they depicted that was great. And it was just a short scene, uh, but it's just like he just buckles underneath the weight and he just like, you've never seen Jesus at such a vulnerable spot other than maybe at the end of season two, episode three, you know, where he comes back and he's like all like, you know, he just waves at them by the campfire. But how they depicted all that was great. Um, and it's just two words in English. Jesus wept but the way they depicted it was great. Um, I thought it was interesting that they had um, Mother Mary run over there. I mean, obviously this is what a mother would do. Um, but to me, uh, maybe it's just because I'm a Protestant watching this. <laughs> it felt like it was a little nod to the um, the Catholic viewers that they had Mother Mary run over there and like comfort him because um, like, I don't know, because, because Mother Mary, the Virgin Mary plays such a prominent role in Catholic theology, right? And um, I think that from a perspective, like, yes, the show is primarily evangelical, but they do a good job of, you know, respecting the views of other people who might be watching the show. And I think that the role that they've had Mother Mary play and the prominence that they've given her um, is, is kind of a nod to that. But also um, they don't give her such a role that would make Protestants mad. So I think that they walk that balance very well. Uh, and so let me go look at what y'all have been saying in here before I continue with some of my thoughts. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. Okay. I felt they would make Judas more likable and subtle in the change of season. So when the, um, yeah, so I also thought that they would be a little bit more subtle with it, but Judas in this season, he kind of just turned outright villainous. Um, it, it, it's the, the writing is very well done and you understand why he's doing it, but the, the turn was very quick and I, I don't know. It's like, we just haven't spent enough time with Judas to really know what makes him tick. 
like we know that he's driven by money and stuff like that. But especially later on, I think it's in episode eight where he's talking to Shmuel and he says, like, the difference between me and you is that, like, I believe that Jesus is who he claims to be. But if he doesn't believe who Jesus is who he claims to be, it's like it's hard to see how he justifies doing the things he does. I guess that all of us have those like inconsistencies within our own lives, right? I mean, like, I'm a Christian, but there's all these sin struggles that I deal with, right? Uh, and so we all have these inconsistencies. But yeah, Judas, um, he did, um, he took a very big turn this season. Uh, Jesus wept very realistically. I agree. Uh, I remember a month ago when I was grieving and recalling this verse when I had thought men shouldn't cry. Yeah, I, I don't know why people say men shouldn't cry. I weep like a baby all the time. Not all the time. I don't want you to think that I'm just like a crying all the time. But uh, as I grow older, I weep easily, more easily. This whole series really does show Jesus as a man of sorrows more than any other Jesus movie. Well, yeah. I mean, Isaiah 53 says he was a man of sorrows, but we don't really see that depicted. But this show does it great. And to me, that's been one of the most compelling aspects of Jesus that has not been explored. Right? So whenever I've worked on those like manuscripts that I've been writing on that I was talking about earlier, I like explore that. Cause to me, it's like, he was a man of sorrow. I was acquainted with grief. What did that look like? Uh, and that's the stuff that even the gospels don't really detail a whole lot. Um, but it's definitely there. Uh, yeah. Judas has been such a disagreeable outsider. Why wouldn't they suspect him? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> they're going to have, they're going to have to do something in season five to like redeem him a little bit because he does. Um, yeah. Like if Jesus, right. Like right now, if the disciples sat around the table and said, one of you is going to betray me, I would expect all of them to be like, well, it's obviously going to be Judas, right? I mean, it's not going to be Peter. It's not going to be Matthew. Not going to be John. Not going to be bigger little James. And it could be Thomas, but it's definitely going to be Judas, right? I mean, the, we'll see what they do with him in season five. Uh, great story on campus. Uh, Peter knows that Jesus has the capacity to raise the dead, but I specifically told him not to tell the others because it's not a point in time. Now the time has come. Yep. Uh, I think they're trying to do is show why there's doubting Thomas. Yeah, I, I get why they're doing it. I'm just, um, I wish it was a little bit different. Um, I like the disciples reaction to Jesus being overwhelmed because they could see how that, that ambiguity. Yeah. Um, their reactions was very interesting. They were kind of like, Whoa, what's going on with this guy? Cause they've never seen Jesus like this either. Right. I mean, we've never seen him like that, but they definitely haven't regardless of how obvious things are. The disciples still won't get it. Jesus told them plainly. And they don't understand. Um, the same is true with us sometimes, you know, I mean, there are things that are clear in scripture, but, um, yeah. Uh, Protestant here didn't think about Mother Mary at all. It was a mother comforting her son to me. Well, yeah, I mean, once again, this is what any mother would do. I think that whenever I watched it, like, I think it's because it's just such a common thing. Like, it's because Mother Mary has been so prominent in the show, and we've seen her more often in the show than we do in the Gospels, that her increased role, like, this is definitely, like, if she was there, this is how she would react, of course, because she's a mother. I think I've just always noticed this because I'm also, once again, I always hyperanalyze everything. Uh, and um, I'm not even saying they did it for the Catholic viewers, but I'm saying that if you were a Catholic viewer, I think that you would appreciate what they did there, uh, if that makes sense. Um, don't know much about Catholic theology, just made sense that a mom comforted her son, but agree 100%. Yeah, I mean, like, I agree. Like, if, if I was crying, my mom would do the same thing. Like, she'd come and comfort me. Um, I just, that was just something that I thought of. Um, yeah, let's see. Catholic here, all I saw was a mother comforting her son. Oh, cool. Very cool. Uh, he believed who Jesus is, but will not accept what Jesus is there to do, for sure. Now we're into spoilers. My favorite is the funny. Oh, borrow a burrow. Yes. Um, my favorite funny was when Matthew said, you want to borrow a burrow? Yeah, we're going to talk about that. That was, um, I, I thought that was a very funny comment. Um, I'm also Protestant, but I think Mary was the only one who could physically comfort him in a socially, cultural, appropriate way. Yeah, it wouldn't be appropriate for the other women to do it, and it wouldn't be really appropriate for his disciples to come over there and do that either. Um, so Jesus weeping reminded me of the Garden of Gethsemane. Yeah, oh man, that's going to be an intense scene whenever we get there. Oh, wait, this is live? Yes, this is, Michelle. This is a live thing. I am talking to y'all right now. <laughs> um, Jesus knows that every person that cares about him is going to go through what Mary and Martha have just gone through. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the burden of knowledge that Jesus is facing, I'm, that is crazy. Have you discussed Shmuel yet? I've been super invested in his storyline. No, but we are going to talk about Shmuel quite a bit, especially in episode eight. Um, so yeah, we'll get there. All right. Let me go back to my notes over here and let's just move on. Um. So Jesus has that breakdown and then everybody begins to slowly move on to the, um, to the tomb of Lazarus. And, uh, this is where Thomas, oh man, he, he's looking rough, right? Thomas is looking very, very rough right here to where even John has to go back and like get him. And he's like, come on, dude, let's go. Uh, but Thomas looks like a dead man walking. He's just like a zombie, just slowly making his way down to the tomb to, um, to see what's going to happen here. And it's, it's, it's kind of crazy if you think about it because it's like this amazing thing's going to happen, right? Somebody's going to be raised from the dead. But from Thomas's perspective, he's going to hate it, right? Thomas and Judas are kind of on the same story arc here, 
right? Because Thomas is going to see Lazarus resurrected and he's going to get mad, right? In the same way that Jesus, Judas is going to see Jesus, his feet get anointed and Judas is going to get mad, right? So the parallel they have there is like very interesting and fascinating how you have these two people on the same story arc and they, um, they're both mad at Jesus for different reasons. Uh, and they react negatively to positive things happening. Uh, I just think that's very, um, that's a very interesting choice. I need to drink some tea. My throat's getting tired. Usually I get to rest my breath, my voice a little bit because Brianne's here to talk with me. All right. So we get to the tomb and, um, uh, immediately whenever they start opening the the wall over like open and stuff like that. Oh, sorry. When they start rolling the stone, that's what I was trying to say. When they start rolling the stone, everybody's like appalled by the smell, which would be gnarly. It'd be really nasty. Um, but just to condense all this down, just to get the main thing I want to talk about. I loved how they played the story of Lazarus, like the resurrection of Lazarus here, especially whenever Jesus, like whenever Lazarus starts walking out and there's this woman who screams and it almost is almost like for for like half a second it plays like a horror movie, and then it immediately like kind of calms down a little bit and stuff. But for that half second, this just like unlocked this total possibility for me that I never even considered. Like I never thought about how traumatizing it would be to see this happen. Right? I mean, that was great. Yeah. I mean, a hundred percent. This is what would happen if you saw a dead person step out of a tomb. Right? You would be totally flabbergasted. You'd be freaking out. I'd never even considered that. Right. Because, I mean, whenever you're reading the Gospels, you're used to Jesus resurrecting people at this point. Right. I mean, you've seen Jesus resurrect, you know, Jairus's daughter. But that was always like, you know, an immediate thing. Right. The dead body was there. She just wakes up. But everybody knows that this guy has been in the tomb for a while. Right. And it's not like Jesus escorts him out. Right. It's not like everybody sees his body sit up. They just see the body start walking out. That would be terrifying. It would, and especially wrapped in the grave clothes. It looks like one of those like like mummies that's just like alive. That would be terrifying. And I thought how they played that was fantastic. It was just, um, it, it was such an interesting take on it. It was only for like half a second, right? Because like I said, she yells, other people yell, and then it immediately like cuts back to like, you know, to where it doesn't get as scary, right? So it's not supposed to be a horror scene. But for like half a second, I was like, whoa, yeah, that would be totally scary. And so I thought that they did that super duper well. Um, I thought it was funny. <laughs> this is just, I, I think I found it the moment slightly humorous because um, the guy who plays Lazarus, because he kind of has like an Afro thing going on. Like you can just like see the Afro like bouncing inside the, um, like, I don't know if anybody noticed that, uh, but like, and, and like the headdress thing they had, him, like, you know, like the burial clothes they had him in, had him in, like, you could just like see the Afro like bouncing where he walked out. I just thought that was funny. I don't know why I found that humorous um, because it wasn't really a humorous scene, but it's just something that stuck out to me. Um, and so Jesus sees this. And what I thought was interesting is that this is just credit to Jonathan Rumi for the, playing the part. He looked both overjoyed and troubled at the same time, uh, which I, I mean, the depth, like the depth into which you have to immerse yourself into a character to convey that amount of emotion at the same time is really impressive. If you think about it, like as an actor, because he looked so happy to see everybody like rejoicing and to see Lazarus alive. But at the same time, like, like you, you could see the, like, it wasn't fake joy. It was genuine joy on his face, but in his eyes, you could see the trouble and the terror that he knew was coming. And I don't know. Like, I, I just like, I, like, even as I'm saying this to you, I can like picture this facial expression in my head. And like, as an actor, I just got to say kudos to Jonathan Rumi. Cause he just, he crushed that uh, because he's, he's portraying two different emotions at the same time. Like, it's literally like whenever the Bible says for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. It's like, here's the joy that is before him. And it's like a foretaste of the joy, right? Resurrection, right? This is what the goal is. But the cross is still ahead, right? And at this moment, everybody's rejoicing at Lazarus coming to life. But he also knows that behind his back, there are people who are beginning to head down to Jerusalem to report this to the chief priests so that they can hand him over to die. And so there, there's there's the, the bitterness intermingled with the sweet, right? As Mary's going to say, uh, at the end of this episode. Uh, but I just thought that was really good acting on Jonathan's part. And so, um, yeah. All right. Let me go back to y'all's live chats here. Uh, I might have to stop visiting the live chats as much just because I'm looking at the time here and I, we, I've been talking for a lot longer than I thought I had been. Uh, and I do want to get through episode seven and eight, but let me go through and just, um, I'll probably just end up start picking just random chats. The Lazarus scene felt so real. The makeup was awesome. He looked legit dead and he looked like he stunk. 
<laughs> that's true. He did. He did. They did. It. The makeup in general is just really well done. Also, I would definitely scream. I kind of laughed when she did that. Yeah, it was kind of like, like the way they played it was good because they, they played it like a horror thing, but her genuine scream kind of alleviated the tension in the audience as a theater, like in the theater as an audience, right? Uh, to where her scream, it shocked you so much. You kind of like, oh, that's funny, but that's true. That's how you'd react, right? So it, how they did that was good. Before we, we went, I said to mom, I'm ready for some zombie action for sure. Uh, made it totally real. That was eye-opening to me who's graduated Bible school and been a minister for years. Never seen the scene so real. Yeah, I mean, that's crazy. Like, once again, uh, Bible nerd, right? Like, I, I love studying the Bible. I have read it several times. I teach it. I preach it, all that stuff. But I had never considered how terrifying it would be to see that happen. Uh, that would be bonkers. It, it, it'd, be, it'd be totally crazy. Um, uh, okay, you laughed at the Afro and the rapping too. Okay, good. Glad I'm not the only one that, um, yeah. Jonathan was spot on. I agree. The whole time I thought, man, I bet his breath stinks so bad. I'm glad they showed Jesus acknowledge it. Yeah, and he asked for food. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, he wakes up. He's like, guys, <laughs> I haven't eaten in four days. Um, yeah, so very good. <laughs> he stinketh, KJV. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, so let's move on a little bit. Um, so Lazarus comes up, says, am I dreaming? Jesus says, you just woke up. That was a good little callback to, you know, the confusion over whether Jesus, Lazarus was asleep or dead. Lazarus says, am I dreaming? And like, I don't know, that was a cool little callback there. Um, Jesus apologized to Lazarus and says, I'm sorry it had to be this way, but he's also not sorry because there was a purpose behind all of it. Uh, I thought that was a, that was a necessary thing, right? Where he's like, hey, I just want to clarify, like, it's not, I, I didn't not come because I was callous. It's because I have intention behind this. And the more that they accentuate that, um, the better. Um, like in hindsight, when it comes to like episode three with the whole Raymond's death thing, I'm glad that they're trying to reemphasize throughout these episodes that Jesus has a purpose behind everything he does, right? Because that once again, that doesn't make the ending of episode three better in my opinion, but um, it does answer some of the theological concerns that some people might have been raised to some people when they watched that episode, right? And so I'm glad that they keep reemphasizing that um, that he knew that. Uh, I do see um, you asking, I need the Bible Nerd shirt. Where can I find it? Um, I believe, so it was found at the Museum of the Bible. If you can see that right there. Um, this was actually sent to me by one of uh, the people who watches this channel, um, Barbara. Uh, she sent me this shirt because I think she volunteers at the Museum of the Bible. But um, yeah, so I've never actually been to the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., but that's where the shirt is from. And so presumably if you went there, you could get it. But I don't know. That was actually a few years ago. So I don't know if you could still get that now, but I wear this shirt all the time. Uh, I usually wear it whenever I'm coaching my little PE kids because uh, they call me a Bible nerd. <laughs> uh, okay. And so uh, let's move on. Let's talk about Thomas, right? Thomas at this point, like as, after people are dispersing and stuff, Thomas falls on his face and he says, what have you done? Right. He is ticked off at Jesus. And he's like, Jesus, what are you doing, man? Like, 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 what you like? What? Like, he's so furious. And like the, the juxtaposition in this is great because here on one hand, you've got people overjoyed by the raising of Lazarus. And then on the other hand, you've got Thomas who could not be more bitter. Right. I mean, to me, it reminds me of Jonah. Right. In many ways, like whenever you're reading the book of Jonah, where it's like where Jonah just says, like whenever Jonah is like overlooking the city of Nineveh and he sees that God has shown grace to them. And Jonah says, I just I, I want to die. Right. To me, that's what Thomas is doing right here um, to where he's just like, what have you done? And he's upset and he lashes out at Jesus um, and he admits it feels too much to him. And then Jesus asks a question. and He's going to ask this several times throughout these episodes. And he says, Thomas, will you just stay with me? In time, you will understand. And um, that was good. That was good. Uh, I, I'm glad that, I, I love the intimacy behind that question. Will you stay with me? And when he asks it, um, it's not like he's expecting a yes. He's just asking a genuine question. Thomas, will you stay with me? Please stay with me. Um, it, it shows that he cares for Thomas, right? Thomas isn't simply a tool for him. He, he, it's, he views this as a necessary step in Thomas's growth. Right, and he views this as a necessary building block in the ultimate story being told. Um, once again, I still don't like Rama's death. I still don't that that whole thing does not sit well with me. Um, and it's once again, it's not for theological reasons because I'm totally fine with Jesus allowing bad things to happen. So I don't have problems with that from a narrative perspective. I just don't. I'm not. A, I don't like that storyline. 
But I do see what they're doing with it here, and I like it. Am I a big fan of Thomas' storyline? No, not really either. <laughs> but the writing is well done, and the acting is well done, and I can see the trajectory they're heading on with it, and I think in the end, the payoff will be really nice. That doesn't make me a bigger fan of the actual storylines themselves, but I can appreciate it from a purely objective perspective. Uh, and it was just, it's a very intimate scene, and I just liked all of what was done there. Um, and then, um, <laughs> I wanted to mention this real quick. Um, oh, okay, sorry, actually, before I get to the thing I wanted to mention, um, Jesus confronted, and people basically say, hey, this is going to cause you a lot of trouble, and Jesus explains that that's exactly why he did it. He's wanting to cause trouble. Uh, so basically, he's admitting that this moment right here, the raising of Lazarus, was an inciting moment setting in motion like like a domino effect to the rest of his life. And um, that is how the Gospel of John portrays it, right? The Gospel of John tells us that like the raising of Lazarus is the moment that sets in motion the rest of it, which makes it very interesting that the other three Gospels don't mention that, right? But um, John and his Gospel is sharing another perspective of this whole thing, which is um, which is really cool. Uh, okay, the thing I wanted to mention is that Mary Magdalene at this point walks over to the tomb and looks in. And I just want to see what y'all's opinion is. I had assumed that this is where the episode was going to end, right? I had assumed what was going to happen here is that Mary walked over, looked in the tomb, and then I thought we were going to get that voiceover where she started reading the Psalm to Matthew, and then it was going to cut back and forth uh, to where it was like future Mary and this Mary like doing that. That's what I thought was going to happen. And then it turns out the episode was like not even close to being over. And I was like, oh, Oh, we're still so, so, so going <laughs> because to me, it felt like, oh, like Mary's walking over to the tomb and she was like noticing the burial clothes and stuff like that, uh, which is nice foreshadowing. Right. Because um, if you just think about it, it's going to be really cool because um, she goes to the tomb. She looks at the burial clothes. She feels the stone. She looks inside and she begins to weep. And we know that all those things are going to be present whenever she goes to the tomb of Jesus. Right. She's going to walk over. She's going to see the burial clothes. But instead of them being unwrapped outside the tomb, they're going to be folded up inside the tomb. That's going to be cool. And then there's the stone rolled away. She's looking inside and then she's weeping, right? Except presumably she's going to be weeping a lot worse in that future occurrence because in that future occurrence, she's going to be weeping so badly that whenever Jesus comes in front of her, she's not even going to recognize him. She's going to think he's the gardener. And so, um, yeah, I just think that was um, really well done. But I wanted to see if y'all thought the episode was coming to an end there too because uh, that's what I thought. I thought, oh, oh, we're coming to an end here. But um we weren't. <laughs> okay, let me go back over here, see y'all's live chats, and then we will go further on. Um, the hope of resurrection is joyous, but the fact we have to die sometimes is great pain. Yeah. Um, yeah, death is the great enemy. I was ticked at Jesus with Thomas. Um, I repented. Good. <laughs> Good. Uh, who cares to question the Son of God? Uh, who dares to question the Son of God? I thought Thomas was going to get physical like he wanted with, to hit him. I mean, to be fair, Thomas started getting physical with Judas in the next episode. Um, it was wild. Um, oh, I hadn't thought of Jonah. True. Hats off to Thomas. Yeah. Uh, I was relieved. I thought it was going to end as well. Glad it kept going. I personally want long episodes. Yeah. Uh, I was glad whenever it kept going, but it felt like the episode was coming to its end. And then it just like kept going and we were like far from the end. I was like, oh, oh, we're, we're still going. <laughs> it was like, yeah. Uh, it felt like a mini end with Mary at the tomb. Okay. Let's move on a little bit. Um, all right. So, uh, we pick up with Lazarus, uh, with his sisters and they're like feeding him and helping him like wash up and stuff like that. And they ask him what it was like to be dead. And I was really intrigued to see where they headed here. And basically they got away with not answering it, uh, because that's a big question, right? So where was Lazarus during those four days, right? Was he in Abraham's bosom? Was he in heaven? Was he in Sheol? Where was he at? People always ask that. Um, and they basically got away with just not answering it um, because there's like several points where he's like about to kind of explain something, but then like he just doesn't. And basically the best explanation we get is right here where he just says it's like, it felt like it was a deep sleep. Right. And so um, presumably he doesn't mention anything about dream, like dreaming or anything like that. He just says it was a deep sleep and leaves it there. Um, and so the way they go about answering this is basically by just alluding back to how Jesus had described the death, right? Like sleep. Uh, and so they kind of wiggle their way around that without Lazarus having to give too many answers about what it looked like to be dead. Um, but it seems like what they're suggesting is that it, he just felt like he was passed out, right? Like it's like he didn't see anything. He was just out for the count. And then he woke up and he felt like he'd just taken a very, very long nap. And then Jesus comes and um, he asked if he can talk to Lazarus, Lazarus separately. And so Mary and Martha get up and they go out to the table and this is where Mary and Martha, they, they have a very intimate, like, like a very like, kind of like fun moment where Mary and Martha are just sitting there and Mary remarks that Martha is just like 
sitting down and like not being a busybody for once, uh, which once again shows the like the effect of Jesus, right? Jesus is actively providing rest, right? Come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. He has given rest to Martha, right? Because now with her brother being healed, she has come to believe in Jesus all the more fully and she can just rest and chill out. And Mary says here, I just wish that we could give him something back that he was worthy of. And just by the look in her eyes, I was like, oh, okay. They're setting up the um, the anointing oil, right? They're, they're setting up the spike nard. Uh, and then she like looks down at the key and I was like, ah, this is like, like, it, it was very cool. Like as they were setting up, I was like, oh, okay. I see where they're going with this. And so, um, I just thought that was really sweet, but then we cut back to Jesus and Lazarus and, um, Lazarus asks, why me? And Jesus responds because that's a good question, right? Because we know that Lazarus and Jesus were friends and <laughs> this is almost a conversation that Jesus might need to have with Thomas. Because right now, from an outsider's perspective, it does look like Jesus is just showing favoritism, right? Uh, because Lazarus is his close childhood friend, and he resurrected him, uh, whereas Rama was just a disciple's, you know, like, it was one of his disciples, and it was like the betrothed of his apostle, right? So from an outsider's perspective, it looks like Jesus was just showing favoritism. But Jesus, to Lazarus, he explains it wasn't so much who as when, right? And so he explains that it really wasn't so much for Lazarus as it was for like, he needs to set in motion. Like, like, like there's bigger, there's bigger aspects to this, right? It wasn't simply about doing an individual favor for a friend. It was about setting in motion the kingdom of God, right? And it was setting in motion the events that would lead to his ultimate death. And so as they continue talking, they eventually lead into the conversation talking about his death. Um, but one thing that I did think was cool is that right here is where um, Jesus says, this was the last public side uh, this was the last public sign on this side of, and then he kind of trails off, right? And the way he said that, um, like, it stuck out to me because literally in my notes, I, I put, quote, on this side of, dot, dot, dot. And then I was surprised because later at the end of the episode, those words came back, right? On this side of, dot, dot, dot. Uh, and so uh, it seems like that's kind of, it, it's setting up on the side of like eternity, right? On the side of what, right? What What is he talking about? Uh, and so Jesus and Lazarus have this conversation. Uh, and there's just some cool things that they explored during this conversation where, um, you know, Jesus, like they're, he's talking about him and his disciples and stuff like that. Um, he says the religious leaders uh, are going to up their opposition as a result of this. His disciples don't understand. Lazarus admits that he doesn't understand because he's just human. And Jesus kind of gets mad at him and says, I'm also human, which is cool because I mean, this is what the text has been. I mean, the show has been emphasizing this season, right? Jesus is human. Right. Um, and we saw that, um, at Lazarus's house a few episodes ago when he was talking with Mary, right? With mother Mary. And so he says, I'm also human, right? So like, I, I, li I like that they have that repetition because this seems to be another struggle that Jesus is going through. Um, it, it's very understated, but if you just notice the repetition of that one phrase, what they're trying to emphasize is that another way that Jesus feels isolated is that people have come to view him in such a high place that they fail to empathize with him on a human and emotional level, right? He is the son of God. And he clarifies that. He says, yes, I am the son of God, but he is human. And a big, like one big aspect of him being a man of sorrows is that nobody gets him, right? Because everybody's looking at him. And even as a human, sometimes you can understand this, right? Because there are some times where, I don't know, like, think about that. Like, you know, whenever you like have like whenever you're a little kid and there's like this older kid that you just respect and in your eyes, they can do no wrong. Well, sometimes that's a big burden to put on somebody. Right. And for Jesus, the good thing is, is that he can't do any wrong. Right. And so he's not going to sin, but at the same time, he has this burden placed on him because everybody views him as this exalted person who has no needs or wants or anything like that. But a big part of the hypostatic union, right? Truly God, truly man is that he was truly man, right? And so, yes, he is the uncreated God who is self-existent and who has existed since before time began, but he took on flesh. And so he's trying to emphasize to Lazarus, he's like, Lazarus, I'm also human, right? And his disciples don't seem to get that. They're looking at him and all they see is God, right? And all they see specifically is the God that they have created, like the, the, like the box that they've put God into, right? And the Messiah they've put him into, right? They don't see him for who he is, right? And they have elevated him to such a degree that they fail to understand what he's actually saying. And 
their beliefs about him don't allow for the possibility of suffering and death. And so here he is marching to his suffering and death, and he's trying to warn them so that they can be there for him, yet they don't even, they're not even listening to him. And so now he's having to suffer through it alone, right? It's one thing, like if I were to tell y'all guys, I'm going to die in a week. And if I were to tell you that, then y'all would believe me and y'all would talk. Like, imagine like for some reason, like I had a cancer diagnosis, right? And I told you I had this many weeks to live. Well, then y'all would hear that and y'all would be with me and y'all would pray with me and we would suffer through it together. And the same thing would be true with my friends and my immediate family. But imagine I told you that and y'all just like, were like, well, no, that can't happen. That's not possible. Well, now <laughs> I'm suffering through it alone, right? Because nobody believes me. Well, that's what Jesus is going through, right? Because Jesus, he knows he's going to die and he's trying to warn them, yet they don't believe him. And so here he is marching to his death and they think that he's marching on his way to victory which technically he is, but there's going to be death before that. And so I, I just love that little thing, like twice in the season, he says, I'm also human. And then Lazarus immediately says, I thought you were the son of God. And he says, well, I am the son of God. It's it's complicated, right? Uh, and so like you're, I, I love the tension that they're holding here. And every time he says, I'm human, they follow that up by clarifying, I'm also God. Because you know, if they don't do that, then everybody on the internet is going to be like, oh my gosh, the chosen said Jesus isn't God. He is God, but he's also man, right? That's the whole part of the incarnation. And so I thought they did that very, very well. Um, let's see, let's see. Da, 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 da. Uh, Jesus said, oh, one thing. I love that they how they explored Jesus' emotional range. This is what I was talking about in the spoiler-free discussion whenever I said the theological reflection and aspects and stuff like that and the exploration. I loved how they portrayed Jesus' emotional reaction to what's going on. Um, at this time period, right? Because what Jesus says, he, he did, talks about three things. He says, Jesus is, he's frustrated with his students for not listening, for forgetting. He says he's angry at the religious leaders for twisting the word of God. And he says he dreads the cup he must drink, right? So at the same time, he is filled with dread because he knows what's coming. He is angry at religious leaders for twisting things. And he's also frustrated with his disciples for not getting it. And I think of all of those, which is probably the most surprising to us, is the frustration with the disciples, because I think that sometimes we don't consider the fact, like our theology doesn't allow for that. And I remember whenever Jesus said that, I remember thinking, ooh, I wonder if people are going to like that phrase. I have no problems with it. Like, I think that's true, right? I think Jesus would be frustrated with the disciples. And I think that there might be times where even with us, he might be frustrated with us for hardening our own hearts. I mean, just read the Bible. He, like, that's how he feels, right? It grieves God whenever we quench the spirit and whenever we, we don't submit to him how we ought right? That doesn't mean he doesn't love us. The reason why he gets frustrated is because he loves us and he wants us to respond to him. Um, but I just, I thought it was really cool how they just like portrayed, okay, so Jesus is like, you get to see his external and internal struggle, right? Uh, with the people who love him, he's frustrated because they don't get him. With the people who hate him, he's angry because they're twisting the word of God and leading people astray and making them twice the child, the sons of the devil as they are, right? Or Christ the children of hell, whatever Jesus says in the gospel of Matthew, right? Um, so with the people he loves, or the, with the people who love him, he's frustrated. With the people who hate him, he's angry. And then while he's like bottled up in it by himself, suffering through all of this, he's dreading what has to come. And ironically, if you think about it, he's going to have to go through all this for them, right? He is going to have to go through all this suffering for the people that he's frustrated with and angry with, but he's going to do it with joy. Right. And so I just love, like, that's what I'm saying. The theological exploration of like how they're thinking, like, what would it look like to be Jesus here? Right. How would the son of God feel towards his disciples for not getting it? How would the son of God feel to the religious leaders who like, this is the guy who spoke the words of scripture and he sees these people misrepresenting his words yet claiming to be the authoritative teachers of his word. How would he feel towards that? And how would he feel knowing where he's heading? Right. And so I think like that one scene right there, like just the conversation with him and Lazarus, I thought it was really, really well done. And I, um, once again, the, the writers of the show have just knocked it out of the park with all of this. Um, let me just check um, a few more things right here, just from this scene. And then I will look at y'all's live chat. Um, um, oh, Lazarus. Um, so th they quote Isaiah 53, which was really well done right there where they start quoting it together. And then Lazarus says this amazing quote. They were just words on a scroll. Now that they're about, now that they're about you, flesh and blood, it's a different story. And in many ways, whenever he said that, it almost seemed like that could have been the tagline of the TV show, right? The Chosen, 
right? Because their whole goal is they're taking the words that are on a page and they're trying to adapt it to the screen. And it's almost like the, this is almost like the writers winking at us saying, that's what we're doing with these episodes, right? It's almost like season four is taking Isaiah 53 and adapting it to the screen and saying, what does it look like to be a man of sorrows? Here's what it looks like. And then we're going to see that into seasons five and six, right? And so I really liked how Lazarus said that one thing. Uh, and then Jesus gets up and he sees Thomas flipping out through the window and we're going to cut out to the outside scene and we're going to see what Thomas does there. Um, and Lazarus asks if he needs to go out there and Jesus says he'll explain it to them at the Passover dinner, right? And so this is setting up ultimately um, the Last Supper where we're going to have this amazing conversation uh, and we know that Thomas does talk in that conversation and he's going to say, you know, how to, like when Jesus says, I'm going to my father and you know the way and, <laughs> and Thomas is going to say, well, how do we know the way? Where are you going? And Jesus is going to say, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. Right. And so um, he says he's going to explain all of this at that table. And so um, I wouldn't be surprised if we have one episode, if not several episodes set just at the Last Supper. Um, and I, I'm assu assuming that would be next season. I don't know. I don't know. Like, so they're, they said they're adapting Passion Week into season five, but I don't know where they're stopping that. Um, I, I don't know if like it's going to be like all Passion Week and then like, I don't know, the cliffhanger is going to be like Jesus in the garden. He says, get up, my betrayers at hand. Or I don't know if it's just going to be like through the Olivet Discourse or something like that. I, I don't know where they're um, where they're going to end season five, but yeah. Uh, and he says, for now, his brothers will take care of him. And so Jesus is willfully allowing Thomas to misunderstand him. And he is choosing to withdraw a little bit and allowing the apostles to step in and do their job of learning to care for one another. So that was really cool. All right, let me go to y'all's live chat here because I've missed a whole lot of stuff here. Um I, I, I don't have time to go through all these. Let me just pick a few. I'm just going to pick the longer ones. Okay, so the Laz and Jesus conversation reminded me of Harry talking to Neville before he goes to the forest to face Voldy. Jesus has to tell someone who... Oh, okay. Jesus has to tell someone who isn't going to try to stop him. Yeah, that's really good. That's like, okay. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, so Harry talking to Neville before he's going to go sacrifice himself. Hmm. I, I would have never made that connection, but that's a very good connection. Um, I got it in scripture, but as I was watching, it made it so real. Jesus Christ truly conquered death. Yeah. Um, that's why it frustrates me so much. Whenever people say that, like, like so, some people will just look at the show and they'll immediately discount it because they just don't like any artistic exploration, but th there's so much benefit to shows like this. Like, I can't even emphasize that enough. I understand people's cautious. Like I understand the need to be cautious. Right. And I myself like to be cautious in things, but people are really missing out on an opportunity to better understand the scriptures by appreciating art like this. And so, um, yeah, like the show really does give you the opportunity to um, understand scriptures in different ways. Loved how the shop owner stressed this particular oil. Yeah, we're going to talk about the shop owner in a little bit. Um, in the Harry Potter books, Harry actively doesn't go to Ron and Hermione when he realizes he has to die. And in this scene, the chosen just realizes the apostles are too close to understand. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, can we talk about having the safe with a key? Is that time appropriate? Um, I don't know. I mean, I would assume so. I, I don't think there would be anything wrong. Um, yeah, I don't, I mean, keys existed back then. I don't see why somebody couldn't have a safe. Um, would they have, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I don't see anything in particular wrong with that. I've never, uh, I'm going to admit I haven't brushed myself up on first century safe practices and stuff like that, but, um, yeah. Wow, so Jesus had to be wise about what he said because his own disciples could think he's crazy because they don't understand. New meaning to you can't bear it now. Yeah, I, a lot of what they're doing right now, I think, like a lot of this is setting it up so that at the Last Supper, every word Jesus says is going to have greater weight. So I, like what they're doing with the fictional explorations is all setting that stuff up. Definitely. Jesus asked how long he had to be with his unbelieving generation to the disciples. LOL, he definitely was annoyed with them. Oh yeah, I mean, he had to get annoyed sometimes. I mean, it would be, it would drive you nuts, right? I mean, you're the only person who has this understanding. It would be absolutely ridiculous. I think season five is going to end with Jesus being arrested. I was correct with season two and season four cliffhangers. Yeah. So I, I will say I was predicting that season four was going to end with Jesus riding into Jerusalem and we weren't going to actually see the actual triumphal entry. I think it's going to begin with season five, obviously. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, let's move on a little bit. We are getting near the end of episode seven. Then we can hop into episode eight. Let me take a swig of tea. This tea was piping hot at the beginning, and now it is cold, and I haven't even started my second cup. Oh, well. 
Uh, okay, so um, let's see. What else was I going to say? Okay, so now we get to what I think is probably my favorite scene of the whole episode. Uh, I'm probably not going to talk about it as long uh, because I would go on way too long about it. But the scene with Thomas flipping out in the courtyard. I, first off, I thought the scene was just like filmed really well. I thought like the lighting and stuff and like the darkness, I thought that was just a really well shot scene. Uh, but the interplay between the disciples here is great because the conflict is just like reaching its peak and Thomas is emotional and uh, you just get to see the apostles like, like when, whenever conflict shows up, you get to see the essence of a character embodied in like single lines. And that's what you get to see in um, these episodes, like in, in this particular scene, right? In this scene, you get to see the characters just like, well, just little flashes will respond with something. And it's like, ooh, that was really good. Um, cool. Okay. Sorry. I had to check my phone real quick. Um, okay. So let me just walk through this and just, and I'll share my thoughts at the end. So Thomas throws a jar at the wall. He says he's done with all of it. He says no one gets it and that he is offended by what Jesus has done, which I kind of get where he's coming from. Like if, if I were Thomas right now, I would probably be offended too, right? No matter what you believe about Jesus at this point, you would probably be very frustrated, uh, mainly because I, I don't know. Like, like this once again goes back to like my frustrations here. Jesus hasn't pulled him aside and explained things to him a little bit. And I know that somebody could respond and they could say, well, Hey, David, this stuff happens in life nowadays. And God doesn't just like speak from heaven and tell us that. And I get that. Right. That's true. Right. I mean, like whenever my dad died, um, I didn't know why it happened. I, I was never really angry at God about it because I my theology allowed for God to do stuff like that, right? I was never mad at God about it, and I still don't know why He did it. Um, of course, I've been I always like try to find the fruit that comes from things like that. Um, but ultimately, I just trust that God's wisdom is beyond my own, um, and I didn't expect God to speak from heaven and tell me that stuff. But one aspect that issue that I do have is that the whole point of the incarnation is that God came in the flesh and he was amongst us, right? And that doesn't mean that Jesus had to explain every single little thing, but in a situation such as what Thomas is going through with Rhema, it would seem to me like a wise leader would at least pull, like, like whenever they see their followers struggling like this, they need to address the elephant in the room, right? And I, I think that's why I don't really like the story arc because it's like, I see what they're doing with Thomas but it still, to me, portrays Jesus under a somewhat negative light. And I'm not saying Jesus doesn't have negative, like, I'm not saying Jesus doesn't have reasons for doing this. And I'm not saying Jesus has to tell Thomas. He doesn't have to. He's God. He can do what he wants. My thing is just from, like, like if you're just considering wisdom, right? It seems to me like if I were a leader and I knew that my actions had this effect on this person, I would need to pull them aside and talk to them and say, hey, let's wrestle through this together. And I would not wait months and months and months to do this. I would need to talk to them quickly. I mean, very soon. And I couldn't simply say, you'll get it in time. I would need to like actually process their grief with them. I think that's one of my frustrations with all of this. Um, and once again, Jesus doesn't have to, he's God. He can do what he wants. My concerns, once again, are more artistic in nature, right? It's just as creators who are creating art, it seems like a very weird place to put Jesus in all for the sake of a fictional storyline. Once again, I see where they're heading, um, but but that's the part where it's kind of like, ooh, okay, because I understand Thomas's frustration because he says he is offended by this, and that makes sense because from an external perspective, Jesus allowed his betrothed to die, but then Jesus went and he raised his best friend from childhood, right? It's not a good look from like an optical perspective, um, and yes, Jesus has done enough things to merit his faith and stuff like that. Um, but, but it is like, I, I get where Thomas is coming from, which is good because I think the writers want you to get where Thomas is coming from. Right. So they're writing him really well because th this is what Thomas's whole perspective is supposed to be. And so I get where it's coming from, but, um, yeah, <laughs> he, he's offended. And I would say rightfully so, because I would say that, um, there, there needs to be some sort of conversation between Jesus and Thomas, um, where, where things are explained a little bit more, I would say. Um, okay. So sorry, just to move on from that, that that's not really something that I need to labor, to labor on. Um, so Judas, he responds that they should be united, that they shouldn't be, um, divided during this. And Thomas outright just flips out on him. And Thomas is about to like attack Judas because Judas says, this is a great thing. Right. And Thomas just, he, he literally gets ready to attack Judas and they have to actively pull him back. Thomas gets mad. He storms out. 
And Judas, he is just not reading the room, right? Judas, Thomas leaves, and Judas just says, this is the greatest day in the history of the people. They're going to be unified against the enemy. And Philip responds and says, I'm not sure that this bullet means what you think it means. Uh, which, in my opinion, I don't know if that's what they were going for. That seemed like a clear Princess Bride reference. Uh, because it's almost like Philip looks at Judas and says, you keep saying that. I do not think this moment thinks, <laughs> I do not think this moment means what you think it means, right? It seems like Philip was stepping in the role of Inigo Montoya right there. Um, and they begin to debate about the meaning of the miracle. Uh, they can't come to a consensus of whether or not there's going to be an army, right? Because they're saying, okay, wait, is there an army we just don't know about? What's going on here? They're still trying to figure out what Jesus' whole plan is. The, the men seem to think there's an army. The women are saying Jesus never mentioned an army. And they're just debating about all that stuff. Um, and then Peter reminds them that no one could snatch the true sheep out of his hand. And Judas, once again, oh my gosh, Judas, like a dude who just like is the least self-aware person in the world. Judas responds and says, he ponders whether or not Thomas was a true sheep. And this is ironic on several levels. Um, first off, because whenever Jesus says that not all of them were a true sheep, Jesus is talking about Judas, right? And so Judas is the one who's not a true sheep, but he thinks that he's a true sheep. Also, once again, Judas, you're not reading the room, right? Everybody is trying to defend Thomas and trying to get you to stop sharing your viewpoint here. But he is just, he's so gung-ho and like, he, he's very naive, right? For somebody who thinks he's very shrewd, he does not know like how to gather people together because he like, he says he's arguing for unity, but he is dividing them more than ever, right? And he's dividing them against him, right? So this is not good. <laughs> uh, and so they all lash out at Judas over this. Uh, and Nathaniel even responds and says, what, has the devil entered into you? Which is a clever reference forward where we know that the devil will enter into Judas uh, and inspire him to go betray Jesus. Um, and Judas responds and says, that's not what he meant. He's just excited. Um, and, and once again, it just shows that Judas, he's just, he's almost living in his own world, right? And it just, it doesn't look very, very good for Judas during all of this. Judas looks very, very bad. Um, where once again, if anybody were to tell me who would betray Jesus, it would be either Thomas or Judas at this point. Um, mainly because Judas is so dissatisfied with what Jesus is doing. Um, at this moment, he's excited, but um, you can tell that this guy's just out of touch with reality, right? Because everybody else is frustrated and they are like, it, it's a sorrowful moment and he just can't read the room. And he is so excited about things going what he perceives to be his way that he just, he's deafened to the, the cries and the groanings of all the other people who are grieving. Uh, with Thomas. And so um, Judas, he doesn't look very good in this scene at all, but it, it's acted very, very well. And I, I like what they're doing with him. But once again, it does feel kind of rushed there, but um, I still think it's done super duper well. Uh, we also see little James here cry out with a huge burst of pain. Um, I don't know if they're heading anywhere else with this storyline. I know that we saw that in a few episodes ago where we saw that his pain was increasing. Um, and we know that the pain's not going to go any way. We know it's not going to go away. Like Jesus isn't going to heal him later on or anything because um, in the flash forward scene, whenever they say that little James died, um, Mary and Matthew reflect on the fact that he was in pain all his life. Right. So we know that there's not going to be like a later moment where Jesus does in fact heal little James. Um, but his pain does seem to be getting more severe. I don't know if they're heading anywhere else with that, but, um, they lingered on it for quite some time. So I'm not sure what exactly that's heading to. Uh, eventually everyone goes to bed, uh, leaving little James with Thad Thaddeus and Mary Magdalene. Um, they say that they feel grief. They no longer have to wonder when that soon will be, though, because they've been talking about the word soon. They say that they don't have to wonder when soon will be because it is finally arriving, right? The soon has come. Uh, and then we cut from there to the flash forward where we get to see um, Mary recite her whole monologue about the darkness and the light and the bitterness and the sweet. Fantastic monologue. Thought it was really well done. Um once it's actually released on the app, I, I kind of want to do an analysis of ex like the whole thing, like line by line. I'll see if I end up doing that on YouTube or just for my, <laughs> for my own fun. Um, but yeah, so, and, and that brings episode seven to a close. Uh, and, and you do get to see like these, like, you know, like just a closing montage of like candles being blown out and Mary seeing Jesus, like picking up the pottery shards, stuff like that. Um, Jesus trying to fit the pottery together. Um, I thought that, like, that, that was like the closing shot, right? Jesus trying to fit the pottery together. I thought that was really cool um, because it's like, you know, he he's, it's the clay and the potter. And like Jesus, he seems frustrated because he's trying to fit the pieces together, but they're not fitting together. And that almost seemed like a metaphor for like what Jesus is going through, 
right? It's like he's trying to give them the pieces, but they're not putting the pieces together. And he's left frustrated by the fact that despite all this power he has, he has to allow the pieces to stay shattered. Um, I thought that was a really good metaphor. Um, I don't know if that's what they were going for, but that's what I got out of it. And so episode seven comes to a close there. We are about to hop into episode eight, but let me uh, go and um, read through some of y'all's live chat real quick. Um, uh, I feel like the point is that Jesus knows Thomas better and knows he can't reason with him at this point. Well, that, that's very true. Um, so Jesus does know that Thomas can't be reasoned to. I think that one thing is just, I just wish that they would talk at some point because Jesus really hasn't, I don't, I don't know. Like, like I feel like Jesus has entrusted the apostles to go care for Thomas through all of this. And Jesus clarified that that's what he is choosing to do. Um, I don't know. Just, I, I think it, it just seems a bit of an odd choice to me. I'm not going to linger on it too much. It's not like, I don't have a huge problem with him not talking. It's just something that to me, I'm like, ah, I, I feel like Jesus would actually go talk with him. Could it be that Jesus is waiting for Thomas to come to him and ask for help? Um, maybe. Um, I, I don't know. I feel like the point, okay, sorry, that was the same comment right there. Tamar's defense of Jesus was powerful. Yeah, I didn't even get into like all the different defenses. <laughs> I kept saying Judas, chill. <laughs> Judas, chill. <laughs> I agree. Uh, mystified me too. I keep telling people I had never thought about how hard it would be to be God and man at the same time. Um, that was Andrew who said that. Uh, I'm assuming, AJ, are you talking about with... um. When he said, has the devil entered into you? That could have been Andrew. I might have just written down the wrong person. Once again, I'm like trying to watch the show and take notes at the same time. And so sometimes I write the wrong thing. Uh, the whole point of The Chosen is to show that they were just human for us to identify with them, for sure. Uh, Jude is just a bad dude in this episode. Yeah, he's just, um, he's not looking too great. I think um, this season really has just turned Judas into a villain. Um, which, is, which is fine, because he is a villain, right? I mean, Judas is one of the greatest villains of all, like to me, Judas Iscariot is the scariest human being to have ever existed. Right. It, it's absolutely terrifying to me uh, when you consider the fact that Judas existed and that people like Judas exist. Terrifying. Um, this season went a lot further with that than I expected. I thought that they, I thought we were going to see the chinks. I, I thought we were going to see some little breaks in the armor in the season, but they actually took it a lot further than I expected at all. Uh, they never got the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Yep. Very cool. Okay, so there was our discussion of episode seven. And now I think it is time for us to go into episode eight. And so let me just go put up my little spoiler tag here. Episode eight, spoilers are ahead. And so let's hop into it now. Okay, we are in episode eight. And um, this episode, like I mentioned, was actually my preferred of the two episodes. I thought both episodes were fantastic. I like this episode even more. Uh, and so I'm excited to talk about this with y'all. Mm, that tea is good. Decaf Earl Grey tea with half and half milk and some honey. Mwah, very good. All right. Uh, so uh, episode eight begins with a flashback. And I will admit that I was incorrect about what this flashback would be. I had seen this scene for like half a second in the first trailer they released. And I got so excited and I was wrong. Ah, it drove me nuts. Uh, so the flashback scene that we have at the beginning of episode eight is actually yet another flashback to David. And I, I'm assuming they just must really like the character of David, which is fair because I like other than Jesus, David is my favorite character in the entire Bible. So I get where they're coming from. But they have used this actor who plays David so much. I, I'm assuming they just really like him or that they're setting up like a spinoff show with David or something like that. I don't know what they're doing, um, but they have used him quite a bit. Um, I, I was very shocked that this was a flashback to David. If you remember from my prediction video, I had assumed that this was going to be a flashback to the Maccabees returning from uh, like, like returning into Jerusalem at the Feast of Dedication, right? And I thought that this is going to be, um, I, I, I kind of predicted that this was either going to be a flashback scene during episode eight, setting up the triumphal entry, or on the Hanukkah episode, setting up Hanukkah. Because if you go read First Maccabees chapter 13, you will read that whenever the Maccabees entered into Jerusalem, people waved palm branches and sang praises as they entered in. And so whenever Jesus enters into Jerusalem on a donkey and they're waving palm branches and singing praises, that's a callback to the Maccabees. And so I had assumed that that's what that whole flashback was going to be. And I was wrong. Uh, turns out it was yet another flashback to David. Uh, and we, and I, I get why they did this, right? Because 
Um, if there was a time to do a flashback to the Maccabees, it would have been during the Hanukkah episode when they're explaining the Maccabees stuff. Whereas here, what they're trying to do is they're drawing the connection between David and Jesus, right? The son of David, right? So here we have David returning triumphal, triumphant from battle, and he is entering into Jerusalem on a donkey. I, I don't know if he was on a horse or a donkey. I think he was probably on a donkey. He's riding a donkey into Jerusalem. People are waving palm branches, singing Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And if you, Hosanna comes from one of David's Psalms, right? And so it makes sense that they portrayed this. And even his, like, um, his shield had a lion on it, right? Because he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Um, I don't know if Jews would have depicted lions on their shields because um, I think that Jews at that time period might have considered that borderline idolatrous. <laughs> Uh, so that, that might be slightly anachronistic and, um, just the ahistorical, uh, but it does send a message, right? Um, if you're, if you're simply looking at it, like if you set aside historical accuracy for a second, um, just that image of Jesus, uh, of David riding into the city, palm branches being waved, the lion of the tribe of Judah has arrived victorious from battle. That image right there in and of itself immediately recontextualizes the triumphal entry. And it actually serves to emphasize to me um, what I despise about the triumphal entry. And it's the fact that people always call it the triumphal entry. Because if you've actually read the text of the Gospels, you'll know that the triumphal entry is not a triumphal entry at all. People mistakenly think it's a triumphal entry, right? Here Jesus is riding on a donkey into Jerusalem. People are waving palm branches. They're calling back to the Maccabees. They're singing a song of David, Hosanna. They recognize that Jesus is identifying with the son of David, the Messiah, they see what Jesus is doing. And they think that like the Maccabees before them and like David before them, Jesus is here to kick out pagan oppressors. But that's not what Jesus is here to do, right? And so as Jesus rises into Jerusalem, he begins to weep and he begins to cry out. And he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, would you have known what made for peace? And so we call the triumphal entry, but to me, it's more the tragic entry, right? Because in this moment, people like, for the first moment, Jesus is identified publicly for who he is, but it's also at that moment where he is the most alone because they identify him correctly, but they misunderstand his purpose. And so I think like, while I would have preferred a flashback to the Maccabees because I thought that would have been really cool. I actually, from an artistic perspective, I'm glad they chose to go with David here because the juxtaposition is great. Right, because all you have to do is you have to see David riding in from Jerusalem, riding into Jerusalem, victorious from battle, and you immediately understand the misunderstanding that took place when Jesus rode in. Right, because you get to see, oh, they're identifying him with the son of David. They're identifying him as the person who is here from battle, but he's not here. Like, like he is here for battle, but it's not the battle they're wanting. Right, they're wanting him to take on the pagan oppressors and kick out Rome. But you know what he's going to be? He's going to be the little Passover lamb whose feet are going to be anointed, right? That's what Jesus is going to be. And so I will say this flashback scene is mwah, fantastic, great. Um, yes, I would have loved to have a Maccabees scene, but what they were doing with this whole flashback scene was absolutely perfect for the episode that followed. And so, yes, artistically, I would have loved something else, but I get why they did it and they won me over, right? So this is me humbly admitting that Dallas Jenkins and them are smarter than me and that they uh they have better ideas than I do on occasion. Uh, no, th this, this was very, very good. And um, th th how this whole flashback was set up was great. Uh, and so David goes in and we get to meet another one of David's wives, Abigail, in this one. Um, David and Abigail are probably the, uh, the best pairing of David and his many wives. Uh, and him and Abigail are setting, uh, they're celebrating a, pa a Passover meal. Uh, and I couldn't tell what they kept calling his son. It sounded like they were calling him Daniel, but um, they, they also might've been calling him Nathaniel. And I know that David had a son named Nathan. I don't think he had a son named Daniel, but I don't know. I, I could have been mishearing all of that. Um, I was also trying to take notes at the same time and stuff. Um, one thing I did find interesting uh, is the notion of like just David having just like a private meal with Abigail and his son, just like with nobody else around. Um, like, I don't know. I, just, I thought that was very intriguing. Um, that they would have been doing that. Also, another thing I found interesting is that everybody, like in this episode, they make a big deal out of eating unleavened bread. And maybe I'm just misunderstanding the custom here, but usually the Feast of Unleavened Bread began with Passover and it's the next seven days, which are the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so 
if the events in this flashback and the events in the episode are taking place a week before Passover, I'm not sure why everybody was eating unleavened bread on this day, because it seems like they would still be eating normal bread because unleavened bread hasn't started yet. Um, I could just be misunderstanding there, or maybe there's just a, a lapse in um, my historical understanding of that stuff, um, or just Jewish practice, I don't know. Uh, but that, that, that confused me several times throughout the episode, because I know that there's Passover, then the Feast of Unleavened Bread afterwards, but I don't know why everybody was eating the Unleavened Bread now. Uh, unless it was just historical context. They're just trying to explain this stuff to you so that you're already aware of it later on. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so that flashback was great. Uh, and then you have David literally taking the lamb and anointing the lamb's feet. And that's going to perfectly parallel with how Jesus, days ahead of time, is going to have his feet anointed. And it's like, ah, okay, so that's really cool. So everybody thinks that Jesus is the conquering king like David, but really Jesus is the, he's the sacrificial lamb that David prepared. Right. It's like, ah, mwah, perfect. Uh, that, that was a great setup, which then led into an even greater episode. Right. The opening credits roll and we're immediately greeted by Jesse and Veronica. Right. Uh, this is like the greatest crossover event in the history of crossover events. Uh, you've got Jesse, Simon Z's brother, the paralytic who was healed back in season two. And Veronica, the woman with the flow of blood who was healed back in season three. They're apparently travel around with one another now, or they, uh, they encountered each other in Jerusalem or something. I don't know how they met each other, but they're preaching together. Uh, and this is very similar to me to, um, what was it back in at the end of season two, where we got to see Tamar preaching with, um, well, I guess that wasn't a crossover because it wasn't, she was, she was preaching with her, the formerly paralyzed friend. Right. Um, or I don't remember if she was preaching with the friend that was formerly paralyzed or if she was preaching with the guy who had been leprous. Um, I don't remember, but um, I don't know. It's cool. Like It's like these people coming together. That's so cool. They're coming together to preach Jesus. It's kind of like what we do as a church. And so you have Jesse and Veronica preaching. The religious leaders call Jesus a coward, and they start kind of duking it back and forth verbally. Uh, but the crowd say that they want to hear more. We cut away from this, and we get to see Pilate and Atticus. Uh, and they have a very interesting conversation, which is really just setting in motion the next scene, or I mean the next season, uh, which once again, this shows the structure of the season is fantastic, right? You feel things in this episode coming to a head, but they're also planting the seeds that make you want to see more in the next season, right? Because as they're talking here, Pilate says he wants to know why Caesar doesn't send more troops. And Atticus explains that maybe Tiberius wants to see if Pilate can get through one week without incident, which is pretty wild because if you think about it, <laughs> this is going to be the biggest incident of Pilate's life. But we do know, historically speaking, that Pilate will... Um, continue to be um, the praetor, or I mean, not the praetor, the um, the prefect of Jude uh, Judea until I think AD 36 it is. I think him and Caiaphas are kicked out the same year. Uh, and so Pilate's going to be good for a few more years, but this week is not going to be one without incident. Uh, and he's concerned about that. Pilate asks him about the ghost, ghost of Bethany uh, and Pilate immediately dismisses it, says he doesn't believe in any of it. But Atticus admits that he has seen things he cannot explain and he hasn't decided if ma if that matters or not. I thought it was interesting the amount of vulnerability that Atticus takes with Pilate here, that, that he shows. Um, this is probably the most vulnerable we've seen Atticus, to where we really see him troubled by the things that he's seen. And normally we usually see Atticus like putting on a face, right? He's always like the macho tough guy. But here with Pilate, he was actually just like kind of pulling back everything and just being like, I've seen things, man. And um, like they actually seemed like equals just talking with one another which is kind of the, the relationship that they established in the previous season, right? So um, Pilate and Atticus, they, they just seem to legitimately just be kind of on friendly terms. Uh, and so Atticus seems like he could share stuff like that with um, Pilate, which I thought was cool. All right, before we move on, let me go and look at y'all's comments. Uh, let's see. Uh, I love David's scene. I hope they have a spinoff. Plus David is such a mirror and point to Christ's coming. Yeah, um, that'd be cool. I thought it would be the Maccabees as well. Yeah, that would be cool. Uh, it was a horse, but who's counting? There you go. Uh, I wasn't sure. I wasn't paying attention to the actual um, animal that he was riding on, but yeah. Uh, I love episode eight, Sad When It's Ended. Another one of David's wives. Yeah, David had a bunch of those, didn't he? Um, um, oh, David did have a son named Daniel. Okay, cool. Yeah, I didn't remember all of David. David had a bunch of wives and a bunch of kids, and I don't keep track of all of them. Um, I know about Amnon, Absalom, Solomon, Nathaniel, but, uh, or Nathan, um, but yeah. Uh, they did a quick wiki. Uh, Daniel was also known uh, as Kiliab. Oh, very cool. Um, oh, yes. Kiliab, also known as Daniel, was the second son of David, king of Israel, according to the Bible. He was David's son with his third wife, Abigail. Well, there you go. Perfect. Um, that was just a lapse in judgment on my part. Um, I, 
I guess I wasn't aware that there was a Daniel in the Bible prior to the prophet. That's cool. Nice. Um, interesting that we get to see pre Bathsheba marital life. Um, yeah, I guess that's true. I, I mean, I guess this would be pre Bathsheba. Um, yeah, because he didn't. Really, oh, I don't know. I guess they really didn't establish a firm timeline there because it didn't tell us what year that took place in. Um, I don't think I didn't see a date, but Veronica said when she was healed last season that the man at the pool told her, Oh yeah, I forgot about that. So Veronica and Jesse already knew one another. Um, wow. That's, that's good continuity then. I hadn't even thought about that. That's pretty cool. Um, what a reunion. Yep. From Google kill app. Okay. Yeah. Thank y'all. Um, uh, it was the guy who was paralyzed. That was the guy who brought her to the room. Okay, cool. Uh, Veronica told someone in an episode that she had heard of Jesus from Jesse. Um, cool, cool, cool. Um, I'm super invested in Atticus as well. I love his character. Another commentary said this is the first time Atticus was not eating. I'd not put that together. Maybe he's just changing. Um, maybe. It it cracks me up that like people draw so much attention to Atticus eating. I really have never thought anything of it. Um, it it's kind of funny. I think that's just like a thing that they have people do to make him look cool. It's just like, you know, eating during a thing. Um, I don't know. All right. And that tea is ass cold now. Uh, okay, let's um, move on. Da, 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 da. I'm going to jump forward quite a bit. Let's talk about the Sanhedrin debates. Okay, I love this. This was so cool. Um, so they, um, we get to see the Sanhedrin again. And I will admit that um, if you've watched our previous episode discussions, you probably noticed that me and Brianne did not talk a whole lot about the stuff with the Sanhedrin. And that's because, frankly, I found it a bit boring. Uh, and I don't mean that in a mean way, uh, because, okay, let me not say, maybe boring is the wrong term. It wasn't narrative, narratively as exciting as the rest of the show. Um, as a Bible nerd, and as somebody who loves first century culture, I found it intriguing, and I thought it was really good, but in many ways, it felt like exposition dumps to me, uh, to where it was like, okay, we really need to tell people about first century culture, so we're just going to use these Sanhedrin scenes to just like, help you understand the culture of Jerusalem, which I think is kind of what they were doing. Uh, and naturally, like, it's a Sanhedrin meetings, right? So it's going to be a lot of talking. Um, but I hadn't found those as compelling prior, but the stuff we get in this episode is great. Um, and it makes the stuff that was established before worth it because we've already been introduced to who Caiaphas is and stuff like that. And I love what they did here with the thing that we read. I think it's in John chapter 12. Uh, where Caiaphas gives a prophecy. And the prophecy is one that he way misinterprets. Um, and in the text of scripture, like like how they depicted it here is different than how I've always imagined it, right? Because in the text of scripture, like, oh, sorry, in the show, let's start with the show. So in the show, Caiaphas comes forward and he says, I have received a prophecy. And the prophecy is that one man must die for the sake of many. Like, like one man must die or all the people would perish, right? So he communicates that prophecy. I had never interpreted it in that way where like he knew he was prophesying, right? That's very interesting. Because to me, I had always assumed that he had simply made the pronouncement, don't you know, it is better for you that one man die than all the people perish. And I had just assumed that, you know, maybe Joseph of or Nicodemus was there at the council meeting and only in hindsight, after the resurrection, did they piece together that that was prophetic. But th their interpretation here is interesting because, like, what they do is it draws attention to it. And I think the reason why they depicted it this way uh, isn't necessarily because they think that's exactly how it went down. I think this was a very intelligent way from an artistic perspective to explain to the audience something that we read in Scripture. Because in Scripture, it says, you know, and he said, don't you know it's better that one man die than other people perish, that, than that all the people perish? And then John goes on to explain, and thus he prophesied about Jesus' death, right? So John explains that to us as the readers of the gospel. I think the way they depicted it here was their creative way of communicating that, um, just in case, because like it's like they didn't want people to miss the beauty behind what God was doing there, right? So here you've got this corrupt high priest who is only focused on himself and who is purely viewing this as a political game, yet God still uses him to speak his word. That's interesting, right? That's really, that's, that's crazy. And there's plenty of examples of that throughout scripture, right? You've got Balaam, son of Beor, um, who is totally opposed to God and his people, but speaks forth prophecy. Um, you've got First uh, Kings chapter 13, this false prophet dude who 
Um, he's totally leading people astray, but then like God still speaks to him. And so this happens a lot in scripture. Um, and I just thought they depicted it really well. Um, I just, um, I'm glad they showed that. And I'm glad that we got to see the political like scheming of this and how he prophesies it and how he recognizes this is from God, yet he fails to understand it. Like it shows how disconnected he is, right? Here, God has revealed to him exactly what must happen, but he immediately assumes, oh, what God wants us to do is he wants us to kill Jesus of Nazareth. Whereas if you know anything about biblical theology, you would know that God would not want them to turn on their own people, right? However, from their perspective, he's committing blasphemy, in which case, according to the Torah, he must be killed. And so that makes sense, right? And so, like, like it's just, it's genius what they accomplished here, like, in how they explained it, right? Because, I mean, obviously, once again, I, I like highlighting the difference between how I would preach this in a sermon versus how they depict it in the show. With the show, they have more freedom with how they depict it than how I could in a sermon, because in my sermon, you know, I really can't go into all these fictional explorations and stuff like that. Uh, and just how they did it was really good, to where, as a viewer, you're like, oh, like, you can see he's, like, right there. Um, and we're going to see something very similar with Shmuel later on, where Shmuel's so close, but he's also so far. And so I just really like the way they depicted Caiaphas there and there's the whole scheming and even Shmuel afterwards, right? He admits to Yusuf that this is no longer about God. And he asks Yusuf if Yusuf's father can arrange a meeting with Jesus. And this is something that I must've just misinterpreted in the first like three episodes. Cause I had thought that Yusuf, I mean that Shmuel, I thought he had communicated that he was planning on trying to go and look for Jesus at some point, but they never did it. Um, but now he says, okay, I want to have a meeting with Jesus. Um, which is a nice parallel back to Nicodemus, right? If you think about Nicodemus in season one, episode seven, I want a meeting with Jesus. Uh, and so now Shmuel, like, like it's cool because Shmuel was at that scene, right? Remember Shmuel was the one leading the opposition against Jesus. And then Nicodemus is the one who went and asked for a private meeting with Jesus. Well, now Shmuel, he sees people even more corrupt than him. And now Shmuel has become the Nicodemus figure, right? And ironically, Shmuel is going to have this meeting with Jesus, but he's going to go the opposite direction of where Nicodemus went. So this, the parallels there are very, very cool. Uh, and so Caiaphas comes down, he shuts, uh, shuts Gadara down. Uh, he gives that prophecy that he misinterpreted. Um, and he says that, like, he also explains the context, like, so that, like, once again, this is an exposition dump, but done really well to where he explains that they don't have the right to capital punishment. So they're going to have to hand him over to the Romans so that the Romans can have him crucified. Right. So they're just explaining like the dynamics so that a person who might not be familiar with what the scriptures say about this, they'll be familiar with it. And they understand why exactly Jesus, why, why the Jews can't just kill Jesus. Right. Why can't they just grab a stone and kill him? Right. Well, it's because the Romans have taken away the right to capital punishment. All the, and so this is the scene that is used for all that. OK, we're in overhead. We need to figure out what we're going to do about all of this. Let me go look at y'all's live chat stuff, and then I will continue with my commentary. Uh, oh, look at this. Brad, you have shared all of the different um, sons. So we got Amna, Amnon, Daniel, Absalom, Adonijah, Shephathiah, Ithriam, Shamua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ibhar, Elishua, Elifelet, Noga, Nefeg, Jafia, Elishama, Eliada, Elifelet. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, those are the sons of David. Uh, let's see. I wish the Bible showed us more of his better marital chapters. Yeah, honestly, um, that's the funny thing about David. Like David's weakness was definitely women. Uh, a lot to process the Sanhedrin stuff. Yes, exposition dumps, but not the worst. No. Oh, it's not the worst exposition dumps for sure. I have seen some shows where um, the exposition dumps are a lot worse. I just recently watched the uh, the live action Avatar The Last Airbender on Netflix. There's some exposition dumps in there. Or the, um, oh, what was it? The, the Fantastic Beast and Where to Find Them. Like the second movie, I think it was. Man, like the, there's some movies when I think of exposition dumps, I'm like, yeah, those those were a lot worse. <laughs> um, where is our former praetor in all of this? Is he overseeing executions? Oh, um, Quintus, I'm wondering. Like, I I'm thinking Quintus might be down in Jerusalem, and I think he might end up showing up again, um, if not in the next season, then in the season afterwards. The Sanhedrins are equivalent to stale bread. Just ugh. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, yes, I thought the high priest was led by God, much like the kings of Babylon and Persia were used by God without actually realizing what he was doing. Very interesting again to see on screen. Yeah. Um, and once again, this is stuff that like I just you don't really see this on screen a lot. And um just the the ability for them, like they've depicted it so well. It amazes me how much of God those guys didn't know. 
That's true. Yeah. Um, oh, God made Caius' prophecy that, um, yes, in one of the first three episodes, Shmuel was disturbed over the death of John the Baptist and rushed out of the temple and said he would be looking for Jesus. And then that thread was dropped. Yeah. So I don't know what was going on there. That was, um, that was very strange. Um, unless he was talking about looking for somebody else and we just all misinterpreted that, but, uh, I don't know. I like that they explicitly said that Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin have permission from Rome to execute someone. Correct any anti-Semitics. Yes, for sure. Um, I never, I don't, I never understand how somebody can read the Old Testament. And, I mean, read the whole Bible and come out anti-Semitic. It's honestly baffling to me. Wow, if that is not good advertisement for this chosen cup, <laughs> guys, let me just tell you this real quick. Okay. So I just drank an entire cup of tea out of this, um, the coffee mug. And by the time the coffee mug was done, it was cold, right? This cup has been sitting here for two and a half hours. And this tea just burnt my mouth. <laughs> that is wild. Wow. Um, and I don't even have the lid on it, right? The lid is off. I just sipped. Wow. Um, that is, that is a good advertisement for this chosen tumbler. You need to, you need to go get this bad boy. Wow. Um, <laughs> I just burnt my tongue. Um, and all through my mouth, that's, I'm going to feel that for several days. Um, good, <laughs> good advertisement. Okay. Uh, sorry for that little side tangent there. I just having to deal with all that. Let's move on. Uh, so they adjourned the meeting. Uh, Shmuel says he wants to meet with Jesus. Uh, and then, uh, we actually cut back to Capernaum and we get to see Gaius saying that he wants to go with, but he has to watch out for his family. Uh, and he wants to tell Jesus, thank you. And he wants to tell Peter, shalom, shalom. And he wants to see if Matthew's all right. And so he tells Eden to go do all that stuff. And I have a little theory here. Uh, and I feel like when I was watching it in the theater, my theory was a little bit more fleshed out than what I wrote in my notes. But I think I was trying to take notes of what was on the, happening in the show. So I didn't flesh this theory out. But my theory, um, <laughs> which I don't know what y'all think. Uh, my theory is that Gaius is going to end up showing up. Uh, because during this whole scene, Gaius seems very hesitant and like, Eden's like, oh, you should come down. And Gaius is like, no, no, no. I think that he's going to come down there because if not, I mean, what? We wouldn't see Gaius again until what? Season seven, right? After the resurrection. And maybe if they go back to Capernaum or something like that. Um, I think that Gaius is going to eventually show up. And I think that his whole family is going to come with him just because the way that they kind of foreshadowed it here, it kind of planted the seeds. And I was watching, I was like, I don't think it didn't feel like a goodbye. Right. It didn't feel like this was the last time we we're going to see Gaius. And they were like, oh, you should come down. He's like, no, no, no. I have to take care of my family and do stuff. And I'm like, I think he's going to find a way. I wouldn't be surprised if in the next season or in season six, he ends up showing up there and um, being with them. And like, he decides to just like full out. Like, I don't know. Like, do you know how cool it'd be? Like, what if he just like quit? <laughs> what, what if he did what Matthew did? Right. What if he was just like, I mean, like the way that they're setting it up. Um, you know, like there was that whole theory that people had about like, maybe this Gaius could be the Gaius that's mentioned in the New Testament at some point. What if they did that? What if they just had him follow in Matthew's footsteps and just like Matthew left the tax booth, what if like Gaius quit? I, I don't know if a Roman soldier can just quit like that. Probably not. But if he just like quit and like went and became like a missionary, <laughs> that'd be wild. Um, I don't think they're going to do that, but I do have a fan theory that maybe he will show up with his family in Jerusalem. and. Um, if so, I think that would be uh, pretty cool because the actor's so good. Um, I think that just the way that whole scene played out, I think that they were setting it up to where like, yeah, expect for him to show up there uh, and it'd be a nice little surprise. Uh, and it would allow us to just, you know, see more with Gaius um, during like all that stuff, like see how Gaius reacts to all that. Um, no matter what, like the reason I also say that is because they're going to have to flesh out the next two seasons, right? Because we're talking with like, like we're talking that, like 16 episodes based off of five days worth of time, right? I mean, the last, like what, we've had four seasons, 32 episodes, right? There have been 32 episodes of the show covering three and a half years. And now we have got 16 episodes. That's half the length that's going to cover about six days, right? They're going to have to bring a bunch of characters there to interact with, or we're just gonna have to meet a whole bunch of new people over the course of the next two seasons. Um, because things are going to slow down quite a bit to where even as we go into season five, I mean, if there's eight episodes and I'm assuming, so this episode ends on Sunday, right? Jesus is arrested on a Thursday. So Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, right? That's five days. That means that basically if they have still eight episodes here, we're dealing with like, like two episodes for one day, 
right? That, that's pretty crazy. Um, and so I'm thinking they're going to bring guys down there and we're going to start – basically, people are all going to be moving down there, right? Like whenever we see Eden and all of them pilgrimaging down there, that they're setting that up, right? Because we don't want Eden and them to just be stuck in Capernaum when all this is going down. Uh, and we know Salome has to be at the foot of the cross. And so we're getting everybody down there so that, um, you know, there can be some fun dynamics with all that going on. And so I wouldn't be surprised if um, that'll happen. Uh, okay, let me check y'all's stuff right here uh, before we move on. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, I liked, oh, sorry. These are comments I've already seen. Uh, I know what mug to buy. Yes, you do. Yeah, they, um, do that. Uh, didn't they mention in this episode that Sh uh, Shammai warned the disciples that Shmuel was looking for Jesus and Shammai did the slow finger raise? Like, yeah, I warned them. Um, I do not remember. <laughs> product spoke for itself. Yes, it did. This is a very good product. Uh, I think the same thing. Guy said it to Jerusalem. I agree. I think that both preators will show up as a future Bible characters that are mentioned. Um, Roman soldiers can't quit. That would be treason and considered desertion before his term service ended. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. So I, I guess I should have clarified that. Um, I, I know they can't just like abandon their office. Cause I mean, like that's not accepted in like any military. Um, I guess it was more like, I didn't know like what the stipulations were in regards to terms of service. Like I didn't know how long they were. Right. I don't know if like, he was just like, or like what the, like once that term ended, like what the freedoms were afterwards, I guess, I guess that's what I'm more trying to, I, I just don't know enough about. I wonder if we'll suddenly get introduced to Saul or Paul at some point in the last seasons. Could be a great spinoff. You know, I think that'd be really cool. Um, People never, people don't talk about this very much. Um, the Bible never mentions Paul interacting with Jesus or being there during all of that. And it seems to suggest that he never actually saw Jesus, but we know that Paul was raised up in Jerusalem. Well, like he, he was from Tarsus, but he was raised up at the feet of Gamaliel in Jerusalem, which means that he had to, like he had to have heard of Jesus, right? Like I would assume, right? I'm, I'm assuming he didn't just hear of Jesus after the resurrection. Um, it doesn't mean he interacted with him and stuff, but that would be a fun little Easter egg. I've always thought that would be really cool. Like just, you know, just have, just have a random person, like, you know, just have Matthew, like walk into the streets of Jerusalem one day and just like have him bump into a dude. And the guy says, Oh yeah, my name is Saul from Tarsus. And it's like, Oh cool. And then just like move on. Right. I, I don't know. That'd be a fun little Easter egg. I would love if they did that. Um, Eden is already there. She was with Peter outside Jerusalem. Well, yes. Yeah. So Eden is already there. That's what I was saying. Like they all traveled down there with the, uh, the pilgrimage. Greetings from Las Vegas. Just tuning in. Hey, Rodney. Good to see you, Rodney. Uh, okay, cool. Um, let us move on. Oh, sorry. There's one person I skipped. We do have a lot of characters' perspectives we can look at. So maybe they'll do some of the same time events from different character perspectives. I was wondering that. Like, so that is also my fan theory for um, season six, right? So season six, they have said, is the crucifixion. And if you know anything about the crucifixion, that takes place over like six hours. And to be fair, it could be that season five is like Holy Week leading up to like the arrest. And I can see you stretching out the arrest and like, you know, the trials and stuff and crucifixion over the course of eight episodes. Uh, like I said, I mean, I have an, like the book that I've always wanted to write. Uh, it's a trilogy of books focused on the death and resurrection of Jesus. So, I mean, like you can stretch that out a lot. Um, but I do have a fan theory. Like, I think it'd be really cool. I don't know if that's what they're planning, but to where you could do it to where season six, like, because they, they've mentioned that they want to do like feature length movies as well. Like you could do it to where and each episode is from like a different character's perspective, right? And then like you do a feature length movie that's like the objective perspective. So I don't know, um, towards like weaving it all together. Um, I think that as we go into these next three seasons, we're going to see them make some, they've already made some artistically bold choices, but I think this is where Dallas is really going to begin to flex his like directorial muscles and like try some different stuff. I could be wrong there, but uh, I think it'd be cool if like, you know, you had an episode from, you know, Peter's perspective an episode from Mary, Mother Mary's perspective, stuff like that. An, an episode from Caiaphas' perspective, right? That'd be so cool to where like, and then you watch each of them to where you could almost like revisit the season and like watch them from any order and you're just gaining new insights. That would be really fun to me. Um, I think that would be a a very interesting way and a compelling way to make the story really um really fun. Like, to, like it would make it so much more rewatchable too because you're always going to be watching for more details that you might've missed. Um, I think that'd be actually very, very cool. Okay, let's move on. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, okay, um, okay. Here, then we get the scene. Okay, Judas wakes up early. Uh, the timeline of all of this is kind of confusing to me because um, it seems like Judas is waking up, but then like very shortly afterwards, we see everybody at dinner, and so I don't know if Judas was just taking a nap in the middle of the day because like 
in, in Capernaum, it was daytime. And the last time we saw everybody else, it was daytime. And it didn't seem like any time had really passed. And the way the previous episode ended, like, I, I don't know, like, this whole thing just kind of confused me. Judas wakes up and he gets up from his bed. He walks over. He steals some money. Once again, not a very good look, um, but we knew that he did stuff like this. The Bible tells us that. Uh, and then he sees Thomas walking and Thomas is going to bury the sundial in the ground. And Judas watches him for a while. And I don't know if this is going to come back in season five or what. Uh, and I've seen other people say this, but did y'all not think that Judas was about to go over there and like steal the sundial? Like, I, I don't know. Like, I was so confused by this because like Judas, like at first I thought maybe he was going to tra track down Thomas and like apologize to him. Right. I thought he was like, oh, I'm going to go tra track him down and apologize to him for what I did yesterday. But then he didn't do that. And then he's, he's like standing there, like, like spying on Thomas. He's not hiding very well. <laughs> he's just like out in the open spying. Um, and then I thought Thomas was going to turn around, see him spying. And then Thomas was going to lash out again. And I thought they were planting seeds of tension, but that doesn't happen either. And then Thomas like leaves and I, and, and Judas like stops there and like watches for a little bit. And I thought that we were either going to like, like it was going to cut away and we we're going to like learn later on that Judas had stolen it or that Judas was just going to go down and do it anyways. But none of that happened. And so I don't know what to do with that scene. Like, <laughs> like there, there were so many different places, like as I was watching it, I thought where they were heading and then it went nowhere. And so I can only assume that this is going to come back in the next season. But that was like the weirdest scene to me in the whole episode where I was just like, what am I watching? Like, I, I, I don't know where this is heading. Um, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know. I, I would be interested to hear y'all thoughts. Let me see if anybody's commented anything about that. Um, they could do the crucifixion at the beginning of season six and then the aftermath throughout the season and then start the book of Acts in season seven. Um, they could for sure. Uh, I did think Judas might steal the sundial and sell it. Crazy. Yeah, that's why I was kind of thinking where it was heading. There are 40 days between the resurrection and ascension. Jesus was seen multiple times and preached to multiple people. They could do a whole season on that alone. Well, I think that's what season seven is. Uh, I'm assuming I'm assuming season seven is going to be. Um, the resurrection, like, I'm just trying to think structurally speaking. Um, I, I understand why, like, if they're wanting to do these feature films, I think I get why they would want to do that. Like, because I think they said they're wanting to do it like the end of season six and beginning of season seven or something like that. Um, because structurally speaking, I, I'm trying to think how they would do this, right? So hypothetically, let's say season five goes from Palm Sunday to the arrest of Jesus. That'd be like a good, like, finale, right? And then season six could cover through his death, but wouldn't you want his death to be like a finale? Would you want it? To, you wouldn't want it like if you're doing the trials and stuff, you wouldn't want the death to be like the season opener, would you? Like, I think that would be like a finale, right? So you would think season six would be building to the death of the finale and then season seven, but th like then it would have to do like the aftermath because there's no way they're not going to explore like those days. In, like, you know, they're not going to explore like the end of Friday and like Saturday, right? They've got to explore that. And so it's almost like, I don't know, like you don't want the resurrection to happen immediately afterwards. I don't know. I'm trying to think how they would structure all that. And to me, it makes sense if they're wanting to do feature films at the end of season six and beginning of season seven, because then it gives them more room, right? So they can make like the whole end of season six, the death. And then you can do a feature film at the beginning of season seven, which is the aftermath and then the resurrection. And then like, I don't know, like I've been trying to like, I've been trying to process that, like the, the mapping it out, um, how they're going to do that. Um, because to me, if I were like, like, if I were making it, I would probably make season five, like how they've set it up. I would make season five, like Holy week and the death, right. To where it'd be like, okay, Holy week, Holy week, Holy week. Once you get to like episode seven, that would be like the last supper. And then it would end with like going out there, or maybe even episode six would be the last supper. Episode seven would be going out and praying and then getting arrested. And then episode eight feature film over the death of Jesus. Right. Uh, almost like equivalent, like the chosen version of the passion of the Christ. And then I would make the next season, the resurrection, but they're not doing that over one season. They're splitting up over two. So I don't know exactly what they're doing with pacing there. Uh, I just went way too long talking about that. Um, but yeah, uh, let's see. Okay. I think he was stealing it to be sold for money. Uh, Judas was super creepy. Just so weird. Yeah. It's just, Judas is an interesting character. Um, yeah. That weird scene was a weird scene. Um, Judas would steal the sundial. I'm glad, I'm glad I wasn't the only one thinking all this. I was just so confused. I was wondering why Thomas buried the sundial. Um, I think that this was, so I, I was trying to process that. I think that 
on one hand, it was him trying to move on, but I don't know. Like maybe it was like the sundial represented him holding out hope that she would be brought back or something. And now it's like, like that was the last thing he had of her, right? It was their, like that thing represented their future together. Right. Um, and if you remember how he described it, it was like time ceased to exist when she was around. And so like he got the sundial, but now he's buried that. So it's like, he's, it's almost like it, it's over. I don't know, but, but he's still carrying the burden of that with him. So I, I don't really know what's happening there. And his, his character doesn't change afterwards. Right. So he still seems just as depressed and sad afterwards than before. So I, I don't know the full significance of burying the sundial. Uh, it seemed like it was closure, but he doesn't actually seem to express any closure afterwards. So I don't know. Um, he needs to have Charles season six. You convinced me. Um, I remember hearing about there being a feature film for each of the last two seasons. So either the film comes first and then the episodes with that would be kind of supplements of the film or vice versa. Yeah. He died on Wednesday, rose on Friday. Um, I disagree. I think he died on Friday and rose on Sunday because um, yeah. Uh, crucifixion at the end of season six. I think that Judas is going to accuse Thomas of stealing the money bag. I think he will steal the sundial and replace it with the money bag to make Thomas look like the one who betrays Jesus thereby. Huh. Interesting theory. I'll have to ponder that one for a bit. Uh, there could be several episodes just on Saturday covering what the disciples are feeling. That's I'm thinking that's what they're going to do, right? Uh, I'm just trying to figure out if that would be in season six or season seven, but I guess we'll just have to wait and find out. <laughs> like two years, three years. Um... Time stands still. Wonder if Judas stole it. Um, this has been a fantastic conversation. God bless you. Be in his presence. Oh, yes. Yeah, I'm going to have to go to bed soon because I got church tomorrow and I want to get uh, I want to get in a run before church. I want to get a long run in. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to have to wrap this discussion up. It's already been two hours, 47 minutes. That's crazy. Um, I guess that's what happened whenever I don't have Brienne here to keep me in check. I end up just talking way too long. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, okay, let's move on because I... <laughs> I lost track of time. Um, let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, dinner at Lazarus's house. Um, there's a lot you can talk about here, but let's just talk about Shmuel and Yusuf showing up. And Shmuel seemed shocked that Jesus recognized him, which I found to be odd. Because we know that Shmuel and Jesus went and prayed together at the end of season three. And Shmuel didn't seem shocked that Jesus recognized him at that point. And then, like, so, like, I don't know, like, th that was weird to me. Like, Shmuel was like, you remember me? But, like, Jesus remembered him at the end of season three, and he didn't seem shocked by it. And then they went and prayed together afterwards. So, like, I was really confused why Shmuel was shocked that Jesus remembered him. Um, But, but I, I don't know, like, I, I, I liked, I loved what they did with Shmuel here, though. This whole thing was great. Towards, like, he, he was so close, right? but he still had that Pharisee in him, right? Uh, it was um, very interesting. Um, Ernan, uh, Yusuf's father, warns Jesus about the danger that's facing them. And I love, this is where I'm saying the jokes in this season are really good. Jesus, like, what, like a lot of the jokes in this season have been like Jesus playing like he's ignorant, right? So a few episodes ago, we had James and John be like, hey, remember whenever you said, ask and you'll receive? And Jesus says, I don't remember saying that. Uh, and then he said, I'm joking. Well, the same thing happens here, right? Where Aaron says, you know, people are going to be coming against you and it's going to get really bad. And Jesus says, oh, I didn't expect that. And then everybody's like, oh, and he's like, guys, I'm kidding. Uh, this is intentional. Th that's funny. Like th that joke, those jokes are hilarious to me because the whole joke is that, of course, Jesus knows what he's doing. Right. So it's like in this whole season where people are confused about how much Jesus knows and whether or not Jesus has the goal behind all this. Like Jesus keeps making jokes. He's like, of course I know. Like I, I'm in charge. I know what's happening here. Um, there's just funny jokes. Um, Shmuel admits to Jesus that he is open about Jesus being who he claims. And Jesus admits that he sees that in Shmuel's eyes. He says, yes, I can tell that you're almost there. Um, and it's just very sweet. Like, I didn't know where they were heading with Shmuel here to where like, it was just good because Shmuel, we don't know who he is, right? He's just, he's just a random character, right? That they've introduced to the show and we don't know where he's heading. Uh, whereas with Yusuf, we kind of know because he's Yusuf of Arimathea, right? But Shmuel, we don't know who he is. And it's like, there's so much they could do with him. And he was like the one who led the opposition. And this whole season's arc has been him like coming to realize that maybe he set in motion things that he like, he can't take it back now and it's going to get out of hand and it's bad. And so he says, Jesus, like I'm open to the possibility of you being who you claim to be, which is crazy 
because he knows who Jesus claims to be, right? He, like he even says earlier in this episode, he knows more than anybody else the teachings of Jesus, right? He knows that Jesus claimed to be the son of God and he has come to believe that that is possible. And the thing that ultimately is going to be his undoing is that he's still trying to force God to fit into his boxes, right? So in one way, he has opened up the boxes and he has allowed for the possibility of God coming in the flesh. Because if you remember, Shmuel and Nicodemus, they had this exact conversation back in season one where Nicodemus was talking about the possibility of God coming in the flesh. And Shmuel says, no, the Torah forbids that. And Nicodemus says, no, it doesn't. It does. It says no one has seen God. It does not say that he cannot take on flesh, right? It does not say that God cannot become man. So Nicodemus and Shmuel have talked about this, right? And so now Shmuel has become open to the idea of God becoming flesh, but he's still not open to other ideas about God. And so the writing is this, it's great. And then it's during this scene that we also get to see the weaving together of, this is the stringing pearls scene I was talking about at the very beginning, three hours ago, right? Um, this is the stringing pearls where we get to see that, first off, the scene itself is ripped from scripture, right? Where they've combined some several stories and um, we're having a, a dinner party and it's not at Simon the leper's house. It's at Lazarus's house and it's in Bethany. And Mary, um, Mary, the sister of Lazarus is going to anoint Jesus' feet. But during the midst of this, as Jesus is talking with Shmuel, he asked Shmuel, what would you have the kingdom look like, right? And who would be part of that kingdom? What do you associate with the Messiah? Uh, and Shmuel explains that he is expecting a Davidic kingdom, right? And he begins to basically lay out what the common Jewish expectation of the Messiah was. And um, Jesus asks what Shmuel will do in that day. And oh, this is great. So Shmuel says, I don't know what I will do. And Jesus responds and says, I will tell you what you will do. And Jesus begins to give a teaching, which isn't found at the, like it, it's from another part in scripture, right? Um, and I, I believe it's from the Olivet Discourse, uh, which would technically come in the timeline of what's going to happen in season five. Um, but Jesus begins to dictate, the, like tell the story about the sheep and the goats, right? About the end of the age, whenever the son of man shows up and separates them, right? And he shares the story about, you know, whenever I was lowly, Whenever I was naked, you clothed me. Whenever I was out without food, you fed me. Whenever I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. And as he's teaching this, all these like thoughts just like begin, like you, you can tell what Shmuel is thinking. And Shmuel is getting convicted because he realizes that he's a goat, right? He realizes that he is the one. And nowadays, whenever you call somebody the goat, they're the greatest of all time. Back then, that's not a positive thing. Shmuel realizes he's the goat of the story where he realizes that he hasn't taken care of the naked. He hasn't taken care of the lowly. And so you can see him becoming convicted. Uh, and if you read this in the context of what Jesus was saying, Jesus is predicting the fact that Shmuel is about to reject him because Shmuel, the whole context is Jesus said, I will tell you what you will do in that day in the kingdom. And the idea is you're going to be cast away. Like, because what you're going to do in the kingdom is what you did here. Right. And as Shmuel is getting convicted, he is condemning himself, right? And Shmuel responds and says, wait, like he, he's so confused as to why the Messiah would associate himself with the lowly. And so they begin to, this is string and pearls, right? They begin to debate scriptures back and forth. And Jesus shares his opinion on scripture and Shmuel shares his opinion. And Jesus talks about, like they start talking about the sacrifices and stuff. And these conversations are great. As a Bible nerd, oh man, great conversation back and forth. It, it was great stuff, right? And ultimately, it culminates in Jesus saying something to Shmuel, which Jesus said to his disciples at the Last Supper. This is the one place where I wish they hadn't done this, um, because I think that there's a certain beauty to Jesus saying this at the Last Supper, and so I hope that they just haven't re-say it or something like that. Um, it's a very weird passage to take out of context to me, um, but it's John chapter 13 where he says, a new commandment I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you also are to love one another. Right, so that's from John 13, from the Last Supper. I found it very strange that they took this here. I think it fit the context and it worked. Um, that's one that I would have preferred for them to leave in the original context because I'm assuming they're not going to have him. Like, it'd be weird for them to like just like have him say the exact same thing whenever the disciples were already all present at this table whenever he said it. Uh, I mean, the apostles were. Um, so I, I doubt they're going to have him restate it at the Last Supper. 
Um, but that's unfortunate because I think it's so beautiful when it shows up in the Last Supper. Um, but once again, I, I just gotta, I've got, I've got to watch the show for what it is and not, you know, force my, force it to line up with the Bible, right? I get that. Um, but um, th this was beautiful how they strung all those pearls together, right? They were, they're just tying everything together to where it's like scripture over here, scripture over here, scripture over here, and it was all in context, which is great. Uh, I'm all about context. Uh, and so uh, Mary suddenly shows up, and as soon as Jesus sees her, he just can't even talk. He's breathless. And I love the reaction here. Um, it was interesting because up until Mary showed up here, I had assumed that this was like breakfast because remember the last time we saw them all, I thought Judas had just woken up. And so I assumed it was morning time. And then by the time Mary shows up, I was like, oh, I guess this is supposed to be dinner. I don't know. Like the, this, this whole thing kind of confused me, the timeline here, because um, yeah, the, the timeline of this episode did confuse me a bit um, because in the scriptures, it tells us this was at dinner time right? But it was really light outside. And so I had assumed it was breakfast and maybe they just changed things or something. I don't know. Um, if I was just watching the show for the sake of the show, I would assume this was all during breakfast. And so I'm just going to say it was during breakfast time because once again, I've been warned by Dallas that I'm not supposed to read the Bible in the show. I'm just supposed to watch the show for itself. And that's a fair criticism. So I need to do that. <laughs> so I'm assuming this is during breakfast, but Mary shows up, she falls at her feet, uh, she falls at Jesus' feet and she begins to anoint his feet, uh, which is a callback to the, the lamb being anointed at the beginning of the episode by David. And uh, this is a great scene. Um, Judas's reaction is great. Uh, one thing that's unfortunate, and once again, I know I'm reading the story of the Bible into it. Um, I wish that the disciples had sided with Judas here, because when you read the gospels, it says that all the disciples agreed with Judas, right? Because it says the disciples disagreed with what had happened. And I think that this would have been a great opportunity to show that the disciples are still on Judas' side. But the fact that the disciples sit there quietly and let Judas make a fool of himself right here, once again, reinforces the fact that whenever they get to the Last Supper and Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me, everybody's going to point towards Judas because he is the only person who is outspokenly opposing Jesus other than Thomas right now, right? Uh, and, and so I wish that they had kind of like had the disciples be like, yeah, Judas has a fair point because... Um, then it would show that, but like right now, every time Judas speaks, the disciples have been fighting back at him, right? I would love for there to have been a moment where like they actually sided with him just to show that they haven't discounted him yet. Whereas right now it seems like Judas is just the annoying little brother that they're like, okay, he's with us, but like, we don't really listen to his opinion. Whereas um, I would have loved for them to show that some camaraderie there. And um, I, I don't know, like that, that's just like a personal opinion thing. Uh, but it's it's during this moment that Shmuel absolutely cannot stand it. And he says, I'm leaving, right? Like, like, like he says, I cannot get past this. And we get to see that he has kept God in that box, right? So he, he can tolerate Jesus being who he claims to be, but he cannot tolerate the idea of a woman touching a man's feet if they are not married. He cannot tolerate the idea of the son of man or son, Messiah even having to have his feet washed or anything like that. Like there's so much about this that he says it is inappropriate. It is a disgrace. It is blasphemous. Uh, and uh, Jesus responds as Shmuel leaves. He says, I'm sorry, I couldn't help you. And Shmuel responds and says, I'm sorry, I couldn't help you. And um, <laughs> I feel like I do this all the time. I uh, this, this brought back, this brought to mind Smallville, the TV show Smallville. I love the show Smallville. And uh, it reminded me of the end of season seven of Smallville. Whenever you have Lex and Clark, spoiler alert for Smallville, if you haven't seen it, but you have Lex and Clark in the Fortress of Solitude. And Clark and Lex says, I loved you like a brother, Clark. I'm sorry it had it in this way. And then the season ends. That's what it felt like with Shmuel and Jesus saying goodbye. Right? They didn't have the same background as Lex and Clark did in Smallville, but um, that's how it felt, right? It was like this, this sad moment where it's like Shmuel had come so close, right? You were right there. Um, and, and ironically, Shmuel and Nicodemus are still very alike here, right? Because remember with Nicodemus, I mean, Nick, like, Nicodemus was very close, but in a positive way, right? Like, so both Nicodemus and Shmuel have had, pri had meetings with Jesus. Uh, and in those meetings, they have come to recognize who they believe Jesus to be, right? Both of them were willing to listen until Shmuel decided not to, right? And so Nicodemus came to believe that he was the Messiah, the son of God. He fell at Jesus' feet, kissed his hand, all that stuff. Shmuel came to realize that he thought this dude 
is just like, even if he is the son of God, he's not going to submit, right? Shmuel came very close, but then he left. And then Nicodemus, his story ended with him just dropping off money. And then Jesus saying, you came so close, right? And so the, the parallels there are really, really well done. Okay. Um, let me go check y'all's live chat comments and then I will go back to my commentary and then we'll wrap this thing up um, very soon. Um, on the crucifixion night, the scriptures say the guards broke the legs of the criminals since Sabbath was coming. So it had to be Friday. Yes. Um, yeah. So um, pretty much everybody, like the majority of scholars would agree that Jesus was crucified on a Friday. Um, some people will say Wednesday. Usually the reason people say Wednesday is because um, the text says, you know, he will be three days and three nights in the tomb. But that seems to be an idiomatic expression that um, the rest of scripture and Jewish texts at the time show that three days and three nights simply refers to a three-day time period. It doesn't have to literally refer to three days and three nights. So you have Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and that counts as three days. Um, but yeah, so so Jesus was most likely crucified on a Friday. Um, agree with the love one another. He should say it along with all John 14 and 15. Um, my favorite scriptures we don't talk about enough. Yeah, um, I love all of the, the, the whole Last Supper discourse is fantastic. Judas was taking a betrayal nap. <laughs> that was actually funny. Uh, I think the scene with Judas and Thomas may be used to teach the lesson of the second commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Um, yeah, that can make sense. Shmuel still does not understand what that Jesus stated earlier when he read from Isaiah. Jesus had come to replace the law. How often do we judge people's actions before knowing their hearts like Judas with Mary? We usually look at the natural before the spiritual. Yep, absolutely. Shmuel, I'm sorry I couldn't help you. Good picture of pride coming before the fall. Yeah. Um, Smallville. Lana would not act. <laughs> it's funny. Update on the cup. It is officially, like the tea is officially warmed up. Uh, it's cooled down to a, a satisfyingly hot manner. So it's still very hot, but um, I can actually drink it now. Um, yeah, so the, the Shmuel plot twist was, uh, it had me sitting on the edge of my seat because I wasn't expecting them to take Shmuel in such a positive manner. And then I weren't expecting them to just rip my heart out and take it in such a negative manner afterwards. Uh, and so that's what I'm saying. Like, it was just very fantastic writing and very believable, right? I could see this, like, it didn't feel like an actor playing a part. It felt like a genuine, like, like just like a genuine person living their life. And um, I remember as I was watching the episodes, I was like, wow, whenever we were watching season one, I would have never imagined Shmuel making it this far. This is great. And then they just ripped it away from me. I was like, no, <laughs> I was like, he, he ended up being a bad guy after all. Um, and then on the way out, Shmuel and Judas talk to each other and you can tell that they're setting in motion. Like we're now Judas has a contact with the Sanhedrin so that whenever, um, whenever Judas does decide to betray Jesus a few days from now, <laughs> which for us is going to be like a year. Um, but a few days from now, um, on, on Wednesday, whenever Judas agrees to betray Jesus, um, he will probably go through Shmuel. And so, I just think about how bad that is, right? Shmuel came so close, and now it seems like he is going to be the one who helps hand Jesus over to death. Ugh, it's even worse. Like, that's just that's just so sad. Hey, guys, look at this. Oh, my gosh. Look who it is. Brienne is popping in to say hello, and she wishes he was here to talk about it. Brienne, so many times in this video, I have made the comment that I wish you were here as well. Yes, I, and I, I think everybody, I think everybody in the live chat agrees that they would prefer if you were here too, so they didn't have to just look at me. You are a much prettier person to look at than I am. Uh, so, hey, Brienne, um, wish you could be here, and uh, we'll have to get you back over here for other stuff. Okay, sorry, um, that made me excited. Glad she's watching. Uh, okay, let's move on. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Oh, the next scene, which is really fun. Uh, we have Antipas, uh, Herod Antipas, Pilate, and everybody around the triclinium table. Um, get used to this type of table setting because this is most likely what we're going to see at the Last Supper, right? Where they're sitting around a table like this. And um, this was just a really fun scene where we just really get to see the um, the dynamic between Herod Antipas and Pilate and all that stuff. Um, and um, I'm not going to linger on this too much, but Pilate mentions that he heard that people were calling Jesus king. And Pilate seems to just be like toying with everybody during this. So the reason Herod Antipas brings up Jesus is because... Caiaphas requested him to, right? And then Pilate seems to just kind of be playing and toying around, just to like figure out what's going on here. And Pilate seems to be very insecure, but he doesn't want anybody to know it. And that's what Claudia is going to reveal to Joanna later on in the episode. But um, yeah, so, so Pilate mentions that people call Jesus king and Herodias and Antipas both are like, huh? Ooh, we hadn't heard about that. Which it would surprise me if they hadn't heard about that. But um. 
I mean, because I'm assuming that Caiaphas mentioned that in his letter, um, at the very least, or um, from his conversation with John the Baptist, I imagine that Herod Antipas would have heard of that. But I'm assuming for the show, they're just depicting that so that you can see, like, you, you can see why Herod Antipas would even care, right? Uh, and then uh, Antipas mentions that Lazarus's resurrection occurred. Um, and oh no, Antipas says that if Lazarus's resurrection occurred, then Caiaphas is worried that the people will rise up behind him like the Maccabees, and this is what sets Pilate off. Because the thing is, we know that Pilate, he he's not on good terms with Tiberius right now, right? With Caesar, he's not on good terms with them. He wants this week to go smoothly, and the last thing he wants is another Maccabean revolt, right? That is the last thing he wants. And so, as soon as Atticus says that, I mean, Antipas says that, he's like, oh, oh. Oh, okay. We need to take this seriously. Right. And Joanna's watching all of this, just like listening, trying to figure out exactly what's going on. Um, so Pilate's shaken up by that. Uh, and then Pilate, uh, I thought this was fun. Uh, Pilate suggests, why don't they just go and kill Lazarus to see if it actually happens? And then Claudia points out that Jesus could raise him again, which is of course, just, um, that's a funny thing that you read about in John chapter 12, that you read that after Jesus, Lazarus was raised to like was raised again, the priests conspired together to try and kill him, which is really funny because whenever you talk about that, obviously you have to mention what Claudia says. Well, couldn't Jesus just raise him back up again? Uh, but the idea, like the way they portray it here is probably much more realistic towards like people doubt that Lazarus had been raised. And so they're wanting to kill him to prove that Jesus can't resurrect. Um, but uh, they, they turned this into a joke, which I thought was um, actually a pretty funny joke. Um, and then you have that scene with Joanna and Claudia on the balcony where um, they just get to have a nice little conversation. And um, I don't know, it, it just, like I, I thought it was really cool just seeing like the female power dynamic there and they get to just talk about how they feel like they're just like puppets in the background watching these men make all these choices and how they can feel that there's this anticipation in the air and they're hoping that it's something more than just this Jesus thing. But if it is the Jesus thing, what does it mean? Um, like Claudia is kind of, you know, like, like, like Claudia's relationship with Pilate's very interesting. I don't know what to make of it. Um, like, like you, you can tell she like loves him, but also like, is they're, they're distant from one another. She also mentions that she's like been like twisting and turning in her sleep a lot. Uh, and that's probably alluding to the fact that she's increasingly having all these dreams, which we know that she's been having for a long time now because she was having them back in season three. And that was according to the timeline, like over a year ago now, probably. So, um, she's been having dreams for a while. And I believe in season three, her and pilot were at least were sharing the same bed. Whereas now they are not. Um, I don't remember, like, I think Pilate was already up at that point. So I don't know if we know if they were in the same bed or not, but she says that they're not sleeping in the same bed anymore. Kind of like Joanna and Chusa because Chusa is now with um, Cassandra, um, the, the blonde girl that we see. Uh, moving on. Um, so it's now the next day, right? And we get to see um, Jesus sending Matthew and Z to go in and get the donkey. Um, and this is where we get the probably funniest line of these two episodes where Matthew says that he is going to go borrow a burrow, which is just funny. Um, I, I didn't hear anybody laugh in the theater, which really made me sad because it, it deserved a good laugh, but I don't know if I laughed out loud, but I did. I did that thing where the air comes out of the nose. I was like, huh, that's funny. Um, I will say that uh, it was interesting to choose Matthew and Simon Z. I wonder why they did that. I wonder if that was just like a, I wonder if there's a reason why they chose those two in particular to go and do this job. Um, I've always assumed that it was just like, Peter and John, just because it seems like in the book of Acts, Peter and John are always together and other things in like the gospel of John would suggest that like Peter and John kind of had like a buddy, buddy relationship. And we know that Peter, uh, Peter, James and John were like the inner three of Jesus disciples. So I was kind of expecting it to be Peter and John, but it wasn't. Um, so I wonder why they picked Matthew and Simon Z. I don't know why they did, uh, but they go in there and uh, the servant asked what they're doing whenever they're, you know, going to get the donkey. Uh, and they say that the Lord has need of it. And he asks that they follow the Nazarene and together they begin to recite Zechariah. And then the man gives the donkey. I thought that was very, uh, I thought they handled that really well. Um, because that whole scene's one that, you know, it's a very strange scene. Jesus, like in the Bible, Jesus says, hey, go to the city, uh, to Beth Page, which is like right next to Bethany. Go to the city and say that the Lord needs the donkey and the people will give it to you. And that's what happens, right? But we, it doesn't elaborate on that. And so I really like this to where you get the idea that this guy picks up on what's happening. Whenever they say the Lord, they're like, oh, Jesus of Nazareth, he needs a donkey. And they're like, yes, he's about to ride into Jerusalem. 
And then both, they're like, oh, those are the words of Zechariah. And they begin to quote the book of Zechariah. Which then leads me to another funny thing that I noticed here. I could have mistaken this. Do the people not call this servant Zechariah at one point? Uh, because whenever he is like running through the town telling everybody that Jesus is coming, I'm pretty sure somebody looks at him and says, hey, Zechariah. But it, it could be that they were calling him Zechariah, or it could be that he made the announcement and they were interpreting what he was saying and they were recognizing that Jesus was fulfilling what Zechariah had prophesied. So I could have misinterpreted that, but it could be that they simply gave him the name Zechariah because his character is associated with that passage. I don't know, but that was something that um, I found intriguing. So there you go. Um, I'll, I'll check y'all's live chat stuff in a second. I just kind of want to get through a lot of this because it's been three hours and 10 minutes. This is wild, right? Normally it's me and Brianne sharing both of our thoughts. And we've been talking about three episodes and that takes three hours. Here I'm by myself sharing my thoughts and we've gone three hours over two episodes. This is bad. This is why I need Brianne here to like keep me quiet a little bit because I just talk for way too long. This is ridiculous. <laughs> um, and so let's, let's just jump to like that final scene, right? Um, we've got the donkey. They're on the mountain, Mount of Olives. They're looking at a Jerusalem. Uh, there is one thing where um, it confused me. It kept cutting back to the same shot of like, like throughout this whole scene, it kept cutting back to a shot of Jesus and all the disciples looking into Jerusalem. And it seems like it was the same shot multiple times. I couldn't tell if that was just like a weird editing choice or like if Jesus was like having a vision of what was to come or something. Like, I don't know, like that. I don't know if y'all noticed that or maybe it was just my theater or something like that to where like, there were several times throughout the episode, like where they were on the Mount of Olives, like getting things ready. And they would just like, for like two seconds, like cut to like Jesus with everybody facing into Jerusalem. And they would go back to other stuff. And then it would cut back to what seemed to be the same shot. And then it would go, go to other stuff. And then finally cut back to the same stuff. And then we get the final scene. That was very strange to me. I don't know if y'all noticed that. Um, it could be that I was like looking down at my notes and looking up and like, I didn't notice what was going on there. Um, but that was a strange choice to me. Um, so Jesus, um, he grabs the bridle, which we did see. I forgot to mention, we saw the bridle back in the flashback scene uh, with King David, which is cool. So you have the bridle being passed down. Uh, Jesus grabs the bridle. Mary smile, uh, Mother Mary smiles at him. Uh, he gives the bridle to Z and they lay the cloaks on the donkey and stuff. Uh, and then um, we get to see Thomas and Thomas still looks dead inside, uh, which once again, raises confusion over what the whole sundial thing was about, because I thought that was like supposed to be closure, but he doesn't seem to have experienced any closure. He still seems to be going through it pretty rough, but I mean, to be fair, all because you bury a sundial isn't going to really change your perspective on things, but uh, Thomas literally just looks dead inside, which once again is such a strange place to take his character to me, because this is what I was alluding to back in like the spoiler free discussion thing at the beginning. I, I don't know what to do with Thomas's character here, because if you're, if you're just tracking Thomas's story arc, right? At the beginning of season one, he was, he was skeptical, right? And we only really got to see him in that one episode of season one. And then in season two, we get to see him beginning to follow Jesus, but we really don't get any like private moments between him and Jesus really. Right. Um, and in season two, we get to see him questioning Jesus quite a bit. And in season three, we get to see, like, I would say season three is whenever Jesus is the most disconnected from the disciples to where most often the disciples are just like, not really like around Jesus that much. Right. And usually whenever Jesus shows up, everybody else figures out about where Jesus is before them. So Thomas doesn't seem like he's had that much time, like with Jesus in particular. And then season four, like I I've argued that season four, we've seen the most fleshing out of the disciples, but that was post episode three. Right. So episodes one, two, and three, we get to see Jesus and the disciples a little bit, but then after Rama's death at the beginning of episode four, there's this huge time jump and you get to see this montage. And then that picks up with like the Hanukkah stuff. And you get to see everybody bonding, but Thomas is excluded from that bonding, right? Because Thomas is going through his whole thing after Raymond's death. And so here we are at the end of season four. And I feel like Thomas just really, like, he, he hasn't really, he hasn't had the same character arc as a lot of them in the sense of like the growth, right? To where he does still feel like a very beginning disciple to me in the sense of he doesn't really have that bond with the others that I was I would expect the disciples to have at this point. And like, it just seems like it's a very weird place to have him to where he's already at such a low place a week before Jesus' death. Because we know that all of them are going to be brought to a low place over the course of the next week, right? Leading to Jesus' death. 
it's very strange to me to already have Thomas at like rock bottom because if things are going to get worse, it's like, like where, where can you go with his character? Right. Cause, and I think the reason why it bothers me is because we know that afterwards he's going to end up becoming this huge hero of the faith, right? He's going to be Thomas, right? I mean, he's going to be the first one who confesses Jesus as God and he's going to end up becoming this amazing apostle. But I, I think the groundwork of it is just kind of confusing to me to where I think that's why I'm not a huge fan of the story arc. Like I see where they're heading with it and I know what they're doing. But this is one of those places where I'm just like, it's a very strange choice to make like for like an apostle, right? To where these are these guys are going to be the leaders of the church. And once again, the Bible doesn't depict them as perfect and they are very flawed. And on the night Jesus died or the, the night Jesus was arrested, they fail. They all fa- fail horribly. But it's weird to me to like start off this week with Thomas at such a low place because we know it's not going to get better until it's, it gets worse, right? I mean, they're setting him on the trajectory to where it gets better on Sunday. And so I don't know. Um, well, and also, even if they were to try to like lift his spirits over the course of this next season well we know this next season can only take place over like five days right six days and so you you can't take a person from that low of a spot to a much higher spot over the course of five or six days right it would take a lot so i i like the acting and i think joey is crushing it and i like the writing behind it uh it's just a very interesting choice and i'm not totally opposed to the choice i think that um i'm just interested to see where they head with it um to where the, basically i'm just saying they need to earn my um they don't have to earn anything from me, but um, I'm saying that uh, I'm just not a huge fan of it yet, and it's going to take a lot of convincing to make me more of a fan of it. I don't know if y'all um, would agree with that or not. Let me go look at this live chat real quick, and then I will um, finish up my thoughts on the episode. Let's see. Um, thought about the Joanna conversation. I always wondered how we would know what the conversations of Pilate and his wife were. Makes sense. Um, yes. So I actually, I meant to mention that when uh, in regards to Joanna. Um, Oh, hold up. I just realized Dallas commented on here. Um, hey, Dallas. D- uh, the character's name is Zechariah. Very cool. Um, yeah, Dallas. Glad to have you on the live chat. Glad you liked part of season four. Okay. I liked pretty much all of season four. Um, I-, I-, I thought it was very good. Um, so cool. So the name, the character's name was Zechariah, which is cool. That's kind of a nice little like Easter egg because his name is Zechariah and he is the person who ends up um, getting to help fulfill the passage that comes from Zechariah, which is really cool. Um, let's see. <laughs> David Dallas is here. Yeah, very cool. Uh, let's see. Uh, big thought about Joanna's conversation. Um, oh, yes. Sorry. This was what I was wanting to say. Um, I really have liked their inclusion of Joanna because that's something that usually when you're reading the Gospels, you don't consider this, but there are scenes that we get that are like scenes like in Roman quarters and stuff like that. And people often wonder how. Well, most scholars would agree that Joanna is probably, like, even though Joanna is only briefly mentioned in the Gospels, um, many like scholars would agree that Joanna is probably responsible for giving us that information since we know that she was in Herod Antipas's court. Um, I know that Richard Bauckham, he wrote this great book called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. I probably have a copy of it on the shelf back here. Um, And he talks about that whole thing with Joanna in here. And so I like that they're depicting that in the show. It's, um, the the show's just, it's so fast. Like they've done a lot of really good scholarship um, with all the stuff that they've done here. Okay, I can't pick all these because I've been going for way too long, guys. Uh, I'm getting tired and I need to run before I go to church tomorrow, so I'm going to go through this quick. Uh, While Simon the Leper is not another name for Shmuel, I've always thought of seeing Shmuel in that scene. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, Maybe it's because the reason Thomas first believed was because he saw the miracle of water to wine. Now he doesn't see the miracle. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, Read Matthew 27, 52 to 53. Uh, Is this not the perfect moment for Ramah? I... I've seen a lot of people suggesting that I would be very surprised. Um, I, I talked about that earlier. Um, I don't think they're going to have Rama be resurrected there. Um, and I, I think that I think if they did have Rama resurrected at all, um, it would actually take away from the point that they are, um, that they're going for in the show. Um, I think that would actually dilute the point. So I don't think they're going to, I think Rama's going to stay dead here. Um, I think Thomas can be a good parallel to Job. Remember Job said if there was a mediator, which was to throw, um, which now throws so much, which now through so much being taken from him, he now gets to see him. Might be a stretch, but yeah. I mean, they're definitely, I mean, Dallas has talked about this. Um, They're very concerned with capital T truths, right? So they're not simply conveying things in the gospels, but they're taking things from all of scripture. And so I think it's fitting that you would see parallels with Jonah, with Job, um, and and Thomas. And so, yeah. All right, let's talk about that final scene. Um, Thomas looks dead inside and Jesus says, the time has come. I must do the will of my father. I know you got a lot of questions, but for now, Will y'all simply come with me? 
And I love this because what they do is they work in one of my favorite moments from John chapter six, but they put it in here uh, because technically John chapter six should have happened at the beginning of the season because John chapter six takes place. Uh, it's the feeding of the 5,000 walking on water and the immediate aftermath. Uh, and in John chapter six, Jesus gives one of the most difficult teachings, right? Um, and basically everybody leaves and Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, are you going to leave as well? And Simon Peter says, to whom would we go? You have the words of life. And the context in this scene is different, but what, but what okay. The, the context of the scene is different, but the theological context is not different, right? Because here Jesus is, right? We're not like, this is not out of the feeding of 5,000 and stuff, right? We're at a totally different place. This is entering into Jerusalem and stuff. But in both cases, whether you're in John chapter six or in the chosen season four, episode eight, you have the disciples wrestling through very hard teachings and they're aware that they might not understand them, right? That's what Jesus communicates here. And then he asks them the same question will you go with me? Are you going to leave as well? And then Peter responds and says, to whom shall we go? You have the Lord's of life. And so Jesus tells them that no matter what has happened, he wants them to know that in this world, he loved them as his own and he will love them to the end. Um, That is John chapter 13, verse one. And I can guarantee you that they included that verse because it is such a great verse, but it is narration. (laughs) And so um, I think that they included that because technically John chapter 13, verse one is setting up the last supper. Um, But I mean, I doubt that like, that'd be kind of awkward for Jesus to just like sit there at the last supper and say, guys, I'm here to love you to the end. No. So this was the perfect place to say it. And so uh, once again, stringing pearls together, they did a great job. Uh, And then Jesus mounts on the donkey. He begins to ride into Jerusalem. Everyone's following. uh, And Uh, Thomas still looks dead inside as he falls behind. And then you pan in on Jesus and the credits begin to roll. And so that is how the chosen season four comes to an end. Uh, And we can already see how chosen season five is going to open. Who knows? Maybe we will get that flashback to the Maccabees. Probably not. (laughs) One can be hopeful. Um, No, but I imagine the chosen season five will open up with um, my, my immediate predictions it's either going to pick up immediately where we left off, right, with the Palm Sunday, or it will open up with a flash forward scene to Jesus being arrested or something like that, right? And then it'll like cut back and say six days earlier. Um, I don't know. It could it could begin in media res. I don't know. Uh, and so, like I mentioned at the beginning of this whole thing, I think that these two episodes were fantastic. I think that um, the whole season four was a dramatic step up. Um, in cinematography, in acting, in in structure, storytelling, all that stuff. I think that this season is the chosen at its best. Um, it has renewed my interest in just like just talking about the show. I mean, I, I love talking about the show with y'all. Uh, I will admit that sometimes I've I've watched the episodes so much that sometimes I'm like, whoa, like I get I get kind of tired. But this season has gotten me excited, and uh, um, it, it's it's made me very pumped to see where they're going to head with all of it. And I'm excited to uh. Yeah, I, I'm excited to talk about it more with y'all. And so this will conclude um, our live spoiler chat uh, for The Chosen Season 4. And now what we'll do is I'm going to start trying to brainstorm different videos I can make. And um, eventually, once they release the episodes on the app, I will be able to actually incorporate footage into videos. Uh, and you can expect uh, episode breakdowns, right, where I will just do summaries of the episodes uh, like I did last season. Uh, and I will eventually produce the Is It Biblical videos right? Which are basically just my long in-depth videos where I break down what's biblical, what's historical, what's fictional, what's plausible, what's probable, all that stuff. We'll break all that stuff down. Uh, I'll probably do ranking videos. I'll probably do prediction videos. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'll probably just kind of come up with different stuff. If y'all have any recommendations of stuff that y'all would like me to do, um, I would love for you to let me know, uh, just so you know (laughs) what I prefer to do. Um, I like to do things that interact with the Bible, right? While I love talking about the show, my main passion is teaching scripture and talking about scripture. And I have a pastoral heart above everything else. And so if there's any way where we can be interacting with scripture and with the chosen, that's what I want to do. And so if y'all have any ideas of what y'all would like to see on this channel, by all means, let me know. Um, And speaking of which, I don't usually like to ask this, but I will do it since y'all have been with me for three and a half hours, might as well. Um, 
if you would like to um, go subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification bell so you know when videos like this are coming out. Um, I will also remind you that I do have another YouTube channel where I post. Uh, it, it's a much smaller YouTube channel with just longer form content. I know I said, okay, not all my videos on this channel are this long. Um, but I do post other videos with longer form content, which are just like more laid back Bible study videos and stuff on that channel. Uh, and then on this channel, I also do um, Bible study videos where we're currently going through the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, I might have to take a brief hiatus on that um, series a little bit um, in a little bit, just because I'm going to have to be making so many chosen videos. I might not have enough time to be doing both, um, but I will ask for your patience as we go through that as well. So thank you so much um, for just like joining me during all this stuff. Um, I have been enjoying reading all these things. I've been trying to like read y'all's comments as I've been going through this. Let me just go read through some of y'all's live chat stuff real quick. And then I will sign out. Dallas said in an interview a few days ago that during the next seasons, they will produce two hour feature films that will tie in the shows and episodes. Yeah. We talked about it a little bit uh, today. Um, I didn't like Peter saying that line in this context, especially since we didn't get the bread of life discourse at all. Um, yeah. See, I didn't mind them changing that. I mean, I would have preferred them including the John six thing because that's one of my favorite scenes in the entire gospels. Uh, I mean like John chapter six in and of itself has changed my perspective on ministry forever. Um, I like, I, I love John six. It's probably impacted my own personal view of ministry um, more than it, it, most stories. Um, but I didn't mind it because the context is close enough, right? Because you both like you have them wrestling with the hard teachings of Jesus. Good night, sleep tight. Don't let the bug bugs bite. Yeah, it's late, guys. It's um, I don't know where how late it is where you're at, but it is 10:56 where I'm at. I got to be at church at like, I don't have to get there till like 9 a.m., so that's not bad. But I'm, I'm gonna wake up early and go for a run. So um, I'm uh, I, I don't get much sleep anyway, so I'll probably still be up till like two or three a.m. <laughs> but um, thank you all so much for joining me. Um, yeah, thank you all for being here. I really appreciate y'all. Um, thank you for talking with me, uh, and for just keeping me entertained, so I wasn't just talking to myself. Um. My name is David Tate. This is Now Let's Be Honest. Be sure to keep a smile on your face. Don't let anybody steal your joy. Remember who you are. And of course, Maranatha. See y'all later.